while he characterizes the genocide of the Native Americans as the worst ever perpetrated, the author of American Holocaust suggests regarding each of the great genocides in the history of humanity as unique, for one reason or another. Point 230 at work here is a concern to put an end to the quarrels dividing the victims and their descendants. It is clear that historians must continue to examine the peculiarity of each of the great historical tragedies. Yet the horror of the dual naturalistic despecification of which the Jews were victims in the 20th century cannot be adequately appreciated if their experience is severed from the colonial tradition, which the Third Reich sought to resume and radicalize, at the same time proclaiming an exterminatory crusade against the barbarians who challenged that tradition. As is well known, following the fall of the Nazi regime, the most advanced German culture posed the problem of coming to terms with the past, how far by tongue der Vergangenheit. We can discuss whether self-critical reflection went far enough. But it remains the case that nothing of the sort occurred in the case of the West as a whole. Such, in the final analysis, is the soil in which historical revision put down its roots. Underscore 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 Chapter 6 Nostalgia for Empire, Historical Revisionism in Britain From the three Germanic empires to the two English-speaking empires. Not only has the West not achieved a genuine Aufar by Tung der Vergangenheit, but gestures and moves in this direction meet with fierce resistance and even explicit rehabilitation of the colonial tradition, with calls to resume it and recognize its contemporary relevance. We have seen Popper deprecating the haste with which the process of decolonization was carried out and Paul Johnson delegitimizing the anti-colonial revolutions and mocking their leaders, not only those identified with Marxism and Leninism, but even Gandhi. However, if the anti-colonial revolutions are to be condemned, would it not have been better for Britain to arrive at a compromise with the Third Reich and thereby hold on to its empire, starting with India? As we know, this is the argument advanced by another British historian, John Charmiley, who severely criticizes Churchill. The latter wanted to save the empire, but ended up losing it out of anti-German intransigence and his alliance with the Soviet Union, the country that had incited colonial populations to rebellion from its birth. Perhaps the prospect held out by Hitler, vigorously expressed in a letter to the Daily Mail on September 4, 1937, of an accord between the three empires of the white race and Germanic origin, the British, the American and the one he proposed to build in Eastern Europe in the tracks of the Teutonic Knights, was not unfounded and unreasonable. Point one. From here it is not difficult to discern the road leading to rehabilitation of the Third Reich itself. Such is the road unfortunately followed by another British author, namely, David Irving, who nevertheless has serious works of historical research to his credit. How are we to explain this startling political and intellectual involution? Hitler was the first to engage in rehabilitation of colonialism, which had been widely discredited by the carnage of the First World War, in which the scramble for empire had resulted, and became the target of the October Revolution's appeal to colonial slaves to cast off their shackles. In face of the deadly threat looming over Western civilization, the Nazi leader had appealed for the unity of Germany, Britain, and the USA, underscoring the three countries' common Germanic origins. Indeed, after having arrived in the British Isles, the Germans had also crossed the Atlantic. Hence, Main Camp stressed, the population of North America consists in by far the largest part of Germanic elements. Point two, in fact, repeated the so called Zweitz book, it was a population proud of its racial ascendancy. The American Union regards itself as a Nordic Germanic state, not as an international mush of peoples. Point three, all the requisite conditions obtained for the unity of the three Germanic empires. In adopting this position, Hitler revived a tradition that went far beyond his country. In the second half of the 19th century, numerous British authors had stressed the blood ties that bound England and Germany, these two great streams of the Teutonic race. Point four, Lord Robert Cecil, future Marquis of Salisbury and Prime Minister, contrasted the people of a southern climate with those of Teutonic parentage. Point five, in 1899, Joseph Chamberlain, the colonial secretary,
officially called on the United States and Germany to form a Teutonic alliance with his country. Point six. This is a vision. Not dissimilar from Hitler's. But such an ideological climate could not survive the antagonism that divided the three great Germanic or Teutonic powers during two world wars and the revelation of the horrors of which the Third Reich was guilty. If we wish to understand contemporary ideological developments, we must begin with the turn that was already foreshadowed with the Second World War and then consolidated with the outbreak of the Cold War. When calling for a struggle against the danger to the West posed by Soviet and Eastern Communism, Churchill, in a letter to U.S. President Eisenhower, invoked the unity of the English-speaking world and stressed the key role within it of Great Britain, with her 80 million white English-speaking people. Point seven appeals for the unity of the three Germanic or Teutonic countries ceded to appeals for the unity of the two principal Anglophone countries. Although he had never stopped thinking about it, Churchill did not refer to the British Empire or the American Empire while the global anti-colonial revolution was underway. Thus we arrive at the present. David Irving is subject to general condemnation, his historical revisionism cannot prosper at a time when the rehabilitation and return of colonialism take the form of its transfiguration into a champion of the cause of democracy and human rights. On the other hand, Niall Ferguson has enjoyed extraordinary success. Rather than rehabilitating the three Germanic empires, he pays explicit, ringing tribute to the two English-speaking empires, overcoming the linguistic inhibitions apparent in Churchill at a time when the communist movement exercised extremely strong influence among colonial peoples. So the question is not whether the British imperialism was without blemish. It was not. The question is whether there could have been a less bloody path to modernity. Perhaps in theory there could have been. But in practice. 8. During the 20th century, empire had crossed the Atlantic, but without in any way losing its beneficial, progressive character, I have no objection in principle to an American empire. Indeed, a part of my argument is that many parts of the world would benefit from a period of American Rule 9. The overall picture is now clear. Before proceeding, it is worth reflecting on why this key episode in historical revisionism has occurred primarily in the United Kingdom. Its center could not be a country like Germany or Italy, where the historical memory of the link between Nazism or Fascism and the demand for living space and celebration of colonial expansionism is still living. Nor could it be France, whose revolution inspired the first great anti-colonial revolution, mounted by the black slaves of San Domingo Haiti and led by a black Jacobin, to St. Elovicha. Finally, the center could not be the United States, a country born out of a rebellion against the British Empire and which, during its ascendancy, frequently adopted anti-colonialist postures. Originating in the United Kingdom, the summons to the West to come to the rescue under the leadership of the American Empire, continuator and inheritor of the British Empire, meets with a wide echo in the USA, obviously, and in the West as a whole. A blood-spattered path to a problematic modernity. Over and above the two English-speaking empires, Ferguson rehabilitates the idea of Western, empire as such. It is called upon to exercise sovereignty, direct or informal, not only over countries that were decolonized with excessive haste, or so-called failed states, or states infected with extremism, as in Popper and Johnson, but ultimately on a planetary scale. This is all the more necessary because of the extremely perilous situation that has been created internationally. In the very title of a highly successful book, Civilization, The West and the Rest, Ferguson seems to adopt the commonplace of the West as an island of civilization surrounded, if not by barbarians, then by peoples of dubious value and reliability. The language used is militant. Unfortunately, the center of global economic gravity is shifting to the East, what we are living through now is the end of 500 years of Western predominance. Yet the gravest threat is our own loss of faith in the civilization we inherited from our ancestors. Point 10 Recovering this faith entails rediscovering the grandeur of the British Empire, and the path to modernity indicated by it, and of the American Empire of Liberty theorized by Jefferson. Point 11 What immediately leaps to the eye is the historical fragility of this ideological construct.
the empire of liberty, more precisely, for liberty, which was urged to annex not only Cuba but also Canada, to be seized from London's control by force, as rapidly as possible, and to become the greatest and most glorious since the creation 12 was conceived by the U.S. statesman in bitter opposition to the British Empire, accused by him of the worst crimes. At least in his private correspondence, Jefferson had no problem acknowledging the horror of the war against the Native Americans. But in his view the culprit was the London government, which had incited these savage, sanguinary tribes. This was a situation that will oblige us to pursue them to extermination, or drive them to new seats beyond our reach. The confirmed brutalization if not extermination of this race in our America was attributable to Britain, as was the analogous fate of the same colored man in Asia and of the Irish, who, sharing their skin color, should have been the brethren of the British. British policy, engaged in sowing death and destruction wherever else Anglo-Mercantile cupidity can find a two-penny interest in deluging the earth with human blood, was at fall. Point 13 Jefferson's requisitory did not end there. According to him, the British Empire was even worse than the one built by Napoleon. While the latter would take his tyrannies to the grave with him, in the case of the British Empire the protagonist seeking to impose absolute dominion over the seas was a whole nation, which was an insult to the human understanding. Point 14 with its despotic, bellicose behavior, which forced the young North American Republic to embark on industrial development and rearmament, it was inspired by Satan. Point 15 in any event, the relationship between the two countries could only be one of eternal war destined to end with the extermination of the one or the other party. Point 16 of course, at the time Jefferson was writing the 1812-15 war between Britain and the USA was underway. But the ideological fury of these declarations makes a mockery of Ferguson's presumption in elevating the British and US empires to the pantheon of humanity's benefactors alongside one another, in fact, in fond embrace. But let us dwell on the British Empire. It should be clear that, in order to form a balanced judgment, we must also attend to the voices of the colonized peoples. During the Second World War, Gandhi did not hesitate to compare the British Empire with Nazi Germany, in India we have Hitlerian rule however disguised it may be in softer terms 17 what in part prompted this judgment, whose appropriate severity is marred by its underestimation of the qualitative leap undergone by colonialist autocracy and violence with the Third Reich was unquestionably resentment at the London government's stubborn refusal to concede independence. Let us now give the floor to Indian historians writing more than half a century since the end of British rule. This is how, on the second page of the cover of volume 2 of his book, one of them summarizes the repression that rained down on the Sepoys mutiny, or the first war of independence, which was waged with religious slogans, as often happens in cases of this kind more than 10 million Indians, 7 percenter of the country's population, lost their lives, most of them massacred in cold blood by marauding British troops. 18 Another Indian historian refers to a secret war against the Indian people, not shrinking from genocide, in connection with the famine that struck Bengal during the Second World War. This is a serious, probably excessive accusation, but the ideology articulated by Churchill in these years seems to corroborate it. I hate Indians. They are a beastly people with a beastly religion. Fortunately, an unprecedented number of white soldiers were available to maintain order and defend civilization. Point 19 Britain was dealing with a race protected by their mere pollulation from the doom that is their due. It would be good for Air Marshal Arthur Harris, the architect of the carpet bombing of Germany, to send some of his surplus bombers to destroy them. Point 20. According to Marx, India was the Ireland of the East. Point 21 Let us turn then to what, by analogy, we might call the India of the West. The Irish were regarded and treated like the Amalekites, the stock condemned by the Old Testament to be wiped off the face of the earth, by their British conquerors and colonists. Point 22 Marx's assertion will hardly impress an intellectual who also enjoys great success in the West because he disdains the few die-hard devotees of Karl Marx. Point 23 So we may cite the judgment expressed by Gustave de Beaumont, the French liberal who was a friend of Tocqueville. What obtained in Ireland was unimaginable religious oppression.
Taken together, the oppression, humiliations and suffering inflicted on the slave people by the British tyrant demonstrated that a degree of egotism and madness is present in human institutions whose limits cannot be defined. Point 24 The domination of the unhappy island by the British Empire is referred to as if it were the extreme limit of evil, absolute evil. This is a representation reserved in our day for the Third Reich. To complete the picture, let us finally take a look at Africa. Between 1952 and 1959, the Mau Mau Rebellion occurred in Kenya. Drawing on the most recent historiography on the subject, a prestigious American liberal periodical has described the methods used by the British authorities to restore order in the colony. In the Kamatai concentration camp, women were interrogated, whipped, starved, and subjected to hard labor, which included filling mass graves with truckloads of corpses from other camps. Many gave birth at Kamatai, but the infant death rate was overwhelming. The women buried their babies in bundles of six at a time 25. What of the American empire? Celebration of it as an empire for liberty did not prevent Jefferson from theorizing the need to exterminate the Native Americans, albeit blaming it on the rival British empire. Nor did it prevent him from being a slave owner and so dehumanizing his slaves as to sell, if necessary, individual members of the black families he owned as separate items or commodities. And all this, it is precisely Ferguson who highlights the fact, at a time when the movement for the abolition of slavery was already well underway on both sides of the Atlantic. Point 26 It is no coincidence if the champion of the Empire for Liberty was at the same time utterly committed to the political isolation and economic strangulation of the Republic of Haiti, governed by former slaves who were the protagonists of a major revolution and struggle for liberty. Over a century later, in the meantime, the Native Americans had largely been wiped from the face of the earth, the situation in the USA, in the summary of an authoritative American historian, was as follows, the effort to guarantee race purity in the American South anticipated aspects of the official Nazi persecution of the Jews in the 1930s 27 yet again, we encounter the Third Reich. We must at once make it clear that it would be misleading to equate the latter with the two empires we are now more directly concerned with. But it would be even more misleading to transfigure two very different empires that somehow conjure up such a disturbing association into champions of the cause of freedom. At all events, the path to modernity, which in Ferguson's view the British and American empires had the merit of promoting, was much more bloody than he believes. Especially problematic is the very category of path to modernity and the view that the peoples invested by Anglo-American, and Western, expansionism and rule embarked, thanks to it, and albeit at considerable human and social cost, on the road leading to modernity, economic and political development, the rule of law, the affirmation and freedom of the individual. This discourse is manifestly unjustified in the case of the Native Americans, the Aborigines of Australia and New Zealand, and all the peoples wiped off the face of the earth. But the evolutionistic schema suggested here is not even valid for other peoples. Encouraged and promoted by colonial expansion, in the American colonies and then in the USA, which from the outset tended to be configured as a new, more powerful empire, a form of slavery obtained that involved an unprecedented dehumanization and commodification of slaves. Traditional religious restrictions having lapsed, the logic of the market radically asserted itself. The male slave's family, wife or partner and children, was broken up into its individual components, each of which was a commodity that could be put on the market separately. At the same time, the racial barrier between whites and blacks rendered emancipation virtually impossible and continued to pursue ex-slaves who by dint of their skin color were forever excluded from the race or community of freemen. The operative system was racial chattel slavery or, in the words of the English abolitionist John Wesley, the vilest that ever saw the sun. Point 28 Anyone who so wishes may include it in the ambit of the path to modernity, but it is hard to equate the latter with some path to liberty. The vagueness of the category on which Ferguson bases his apologia for empire is evident who represented modernity during the war waged by Britain to force China to open its ports to opium imports. Which is more modern, free trade in opium or its prohibition?
the laws enforced today in virtually every country in the world would seem to attest to the modernity not of the colonialist aggressor, but of its victim. And who represented modernity when, in the mid-19th century, China was torn apart and drenched with blood by a massive civil war? Was it the Taiping, headed by a leader reared on Christian literature and, albeit confusedly, inspired by the ambition to introduce radical reforms? Or the Manchu dynasty, guarantor of the Ancien Regime, clinging on to power and the Confucian tradition, and ultimately supported by Great Britain? Although an ardent chauvinist, who was even inclined to justify the genocidal practices deemed necessary to conquer Algeria 29 Tocqueville had the required intellectual honesty to acknowledge a key point, we have rendered Muslim society much more wretched, disordered, ignorant and barbaric than it was before it knew us 30. The category on which Ferguson relies to rehabilitate and celebrate the British and American empires proves even more debatable if we analyze it in the light of the phenomenon of fundamentalism, something at the heart of current political and ideological debates, but which is far from recent. Two historical episodes in two different continents are instructive. At the start of the 19th century, the United States witnessed the development of one of the first attempts to mount organized resistance to the invasion and devastation of the white colonists. This was the anti-colonialist movement led by Tecumesh and his brother. They blamed the tragedy consuming their people on the abandonment of old traditions. Among other things, their people must divest themselves of European clothing, which had been adopted, and return to leather apparel. This vision was less ingenuous than it might seem at first blush. White expansionism was all the more devastating in that it ran like a steamroller over the customs and identity of the subjugated populations, which were compelled or impelled to renounce Native American dances and feasts and adopt civilized American clothing. Returning to one's origins was a desperate attempt to recover the negated, repressed identity, in order to mount a minimum of resistance. We are dealing with a total rejection of modernity, of a fundamentalist kind. But this was a reaction to colonial expansion, which thus, far from opening up the path to modernity, ended up obstructing it, rendering it hateful in the eyes of its victims. Now let us turn back to the chapter of history that unfolded in China. Some decades after the repression whereby the Manchu dynasty, with British help, broke the Taiping Rebellion, which had evinced profound hostility to the dominant power and the Confucian tradition, and looked with interest and sympathy to Christianity and the West, a movement developed with quite different, even contrary, characteristics. The year was 1900. Along with the invaders and their accomplices, the boxers also targeted Western ideas and even technical inventions, while they fanatically defended indigenous religious and political traditions. The telegraph, railways, and Christianity were not spared their frenzy. The penetration of these things into China had coincided with the deployment of the West's technological and ideological power and the country's consequent national humiliation. Anything regarded as alien to the authentic Chinese tradition and the good old days, or times rendered good by their transfiguration, China prior to the clash with the great colonial powers, was unequivocally condemned. Once again, we are dealing with a rebellion of a fundamentalist kind, it was the expression not of an endogenous evolution of the indigenous culture, but of a desperate attempt to resist colonialist aggression, which once more created an aversion to such oppressive modernity in the subjugated peoples. 31. Albeit in a different way, the effects of colonialism could also be devastating for the conquerors. We have evidence of this from India. Following the mutiny of the sepoys, Indians to all intents and purposes became Negroes as far as the British colonizers were concerned, members of an inferior race with whom it was necessary to avoid any form of contamination, including, in the first instance, sexual contamination, in the aftermath of the 1857 mutiny attitudes towards interracial sex hardened as part of a general process of segregation. By 1901 racial segregation was the norm in most of the British Empire 32 is the advent of racism, or its exacerbation, in a process that had its bloody culmination in the Third Reich, to be included in the path to modernity. Even if we focus exclusively on the economic dimension of the issue, 
there is no doubt that the influx of British manufactured goods from 1913 led to very large de-industrialization in India. Colonial rule entailed the collapse of handicrafts and the textile industry, and the reduction of the Asian country to a supplier of raw materials for the British textile industry. 33 Once again, the question dictates itself, was this the path to modernity? Between repression and transfiguration of U.S. colonialism. Over and above the British and American empires, what is celebrated in Ferguson is Western civilization and its irresistible expansion from 1500, i.e. from the discovery conquest of America no previous civilization had ever achieved such dominance as the West has achieved over the rest. By 1913, 11 Western empires controlled nearly three-fifths of all territory and population and more than three-quarters, a staggering 79 percenter, of global economic output. The 11 Western empires referred to are listed as Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, Russia, the United Kingdom and the United States. 34. Paradoxically, it is the leading country of the West that contests the spatial delimitation of Western colonialism celebrated by the British historian. On February 27, 2003, the then U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld declared, We're not a colonial power. We've never been a colonial power. 35 This was a declaration made on the eve of the Second Gulf War and not long after the establishment of an infamous concentration camp at Guantanamo, on territory seized from Cuba. But such circumstances, which derive from the history of colonialism, do not trouble the good conscience of the U.S. politician. Oblivious of the fact, Rumsfeld could boast illustrious precedents in support of his thesis. Let us see how in 1919 Joseph Scumpeter refuted the thesis formulated by Lenin while the carnage of the First World War was still underway. Imperialism, and the war bound up with it, as the highest stage of capitalism. Nothing could be further from the truth, objected the great economist. To appreciate this, it was necessary to examine the United States. It was precisely there, where capitalism was particularly developed, that the ideal of peace ruled unchallenged in political culture and practice. Traditionally absent were the aspirations to colonial expansion and domination and the bellicose sentiments widespread in Europe, where the influence of the pre-capitalist Ancien regime was still strongly felt. 36 40 years later, Hannah Arendt revived and radicalized the interpretation of the USA as a country without a colonial past, the colonialism and imperialism of European nations was the one great crime in which America was never involved. 37 in this depiction, in what was an incredible oversight for two major intellectuals, there was no room for the war against Mexico and its dismemberment, for the colonization and annexation of Hawaii, for the conquest of the Philippines and the ruthless repression of its independence movement, sometimes explicitly drawing on the genocidal practices employed during the campaigns against the Native Americans. We thus encounter a sensational instance of repression, namely, of the expropriation, deportation and decimation of the natives, for the purposes of acquiring land that was often cultivated by the forced labor of black slaves, who were deported from Africa on voyages marked by high mortality rates. Not by chance, as we have seen, this chapter of history inspired Hitler, who identified the natives of Eastern Europe as Indians to be expropriated and decimated so as to enable the Germanization of the conquered territories, while the survivors were destined to work like black slaves in the service of the master race. Yet according to Arendt, this chapter of history, which encompasses the time span of the West's colonial expansionism and encapsulates all its horror, has nothing to do with the history of colonialism, at least as regards its initial American phase. And the philosopher formulated this thesis precisely when forced to come to terms with the struggle of African Americans, who, also under the impetus of the global wave of anti-colonialist revolution, aimed to put an end to the regime of white supremacy in the southern USA. In reality, Far from being absent from the history of the North American Republic, the great crime of colonialism was a decisive factor at the moment of its foundation in the wake of the War of Independence. What was the underlying reason for the conflict? We may give the floor to Theodore Roosevelt, 
U.S. President from 1901 to 1909. The chief factor in producing the revolution, and later in producing the War of 1812, was the inability of the motherland country to understand that the freemen who went forth to conquer a continent should be encouraged in that work. The spread of the hardy, venturesome backwoodsmen was to most of the statesmen of London a matter of anxiety rather than of pride, and the famous Quebec Act of 1774 was in part designed with the purpose of keeping the English-speaking settlements permanently east of the Alleghenies, and preserving the might and beautiful valley of the Ohio as a hunting ground for savages. 38. The colonialist and expansionist impulse behind the rebellion of the British colonists in America is lucidly and proudly stated here, and Arendt and Scumpeter are resoundingly contradicted. According to the latter, aspirations to peace characterize a purely capitalist country, the USA, without an ancien regime behind it. In reality, Roosevelt celebrated the foundation of the North American Republic in the name of the white race's right to unlimited colonial expansion, imposed by force of arms. We are dealing with a statesman who is prominent in the Republic's pantheon, but who hymned war as such, mocked those who shrink from blood, theorized a war of extermination against the inferior races, and referred almost with amusement to the genocide of the natives, see Chapter 3, 3, and Chapter 5, 5. Not only in practice, but also in theory, colonialism and imperialism have played an essential, nefarious role in the history of the USA. A professional historian cannot be unaware of all this, and Ferguson indeed observes, there were no more self-confident imperialists than the founding fathers themselves. To take but one example, it was George Washington who referred to the country born out of the War of Independence as a nascent empire or infant empire. 39 We are dealing not only with imperialists, but with imperialists who were unscrupulous. Their priority was to rid themselves of the restrictions imposed by the British Crown on their westwards expansion at the expense of the Native Americans. This was an absolutely intolerable limitation for those ruled by an expansionist vision of the future a vision of manifest larceny that was especially dear to property speculators like George Washington. Point 40 The manifest destiny that presided over the USA's irresistible expansion in the 19th century stands revealed for what, from the outset, it really was, manifest larceny. Can one imagine a more radical demystification of US imperialism, its founding fathers and founding myths? However, for the British historian such remarks are quite the opposite of elements of condemnation or criticism. Whether his focus is on the past, the present or the future, Ferguson continues to refer reverently to the empire for liberty. Possibly unawares, Ferguson joins up with the most enthusiastic champions of US imperialism. In the early 20th century, Albert J. Beveridge paid tribute both to the gospel of liberty, which was embodied in the North American Republic, and U.S. imperialism. Point 41 He dated from Jefferson, the first imperialist of the Republic, the irresistible march of the people sprung from the most masterful blood of history, who were aided by God and were in fact to be regarded as his chosen people. Thus were explained successive conquests, Hawaii is ours, Puerto Rico is to be ours, at the prayer of her people Cuba finally is to be ours, the flag of a liberal government is to float over the Philippines 42 where the U.S. Senator summoned the English People's League of God to realize the permanent peace of this war-torn world 43 around a century later an analogous function is attributed by the British historian to the providential handover whereby the American Empire replaced its British counterpart. Ferguson feels wholly at ease in the political and cultural climate of the USA in the early 21st century. Not a few voices warmly greet the empire in the process of being constructed, there are even those who refer to the establishment of a colonial office with the task of administering the immense colonial and imperial space which, in one way or another, is subordinate to Washington. The British historian expresses his pleasure at the fact that US strategists, or at least the most open-minded among them, have finally recognized the reality and necessity of empire, uninhibited by linguistic censorship. Point 44 Rumsfeld is therefore wrong to adopt an anti-colonial posture. In so doing, he is at odds with the Founding Fathers. It is necessary to face the facts, 
the United States has acquired an empire, but Americans themselves lack the imperial cast of mind. They would rather consume than conquer. They would rather build shopping malls than nations. To summarize, what characterizes the people and leaders of the USA is, alas, the absence of the will to power, and this risks ruining such a beneficent empire. Point 45. This is an episode in the history of ideology that recalls one which occurred in the USA more than a century and a half ago. In the mid 19th century, as the conflict that would issue in the Civil War intensified, John Calhoun, calling a halt to hesitant, shame faced justifications of black slavery, declared that it was a positive good. The South had nothing to be ashamed about it could only be proud. In the years immediately following the dissolution of the USSR and, above all, NATO's triumphant war against Yugoslavia, empire and imperialism likewise seemed a positive good, which the West and the USA should not renounce and of which they could be proud. This was a short-lived ideological season, in part because the unexpectedly rapid rise of China led to the emergence of serious doubts about the durability of Western supremacy. These are doubts that Ferguson vainly seeks to flee. Here, then, we have a remarkable combination of seeming demystification and actual apologia. The seeming demystification targets the linguistic interdictions that aim to camouflage imperialist practice and risk impeding it. The apologia concerns that practice, which is called upon to be deployed uninhibitedly, more decisively, and energetically. This combination is a formula for success. Reviewers can celebrate Ferguson's books as brilliant and provocative. Imperial governments and chancelleries receive encouragement and can pursue, even radicalize, their traditional policy safe from any real criticism. Apologia for the West and its enfant terrible. The combination in various forms of traditional apologia with an apparently debunking language marks Ferguson's discourse as a whole. Let us see how he treats the opium wars, the encounter clash between the United Kingdom and the oldest civilization in the world. Like the other European powers, Britain too knew how to make war pay in the 19th century, something in the region of 40 per center of the total defense budget for 1842 was covered by the 5.8 million pounds indemnity exacted from China under the Treaty of Nanking. Palmerston even boasted to the House of Commons that the war had shown a profit 46 as we see, there is no room here for an edifying vision a la John Stuart Mill, who celebrated the Opium Wars as a crusade for free trade and liberty as such, the prohibition of the importation of opium into China violated the liberty of the buyer even more than that of the producer or seller. Point 47 We find nothing of the sort in Ferguson. He reports Palmerston's statement in a paragraph whose title is eloquent in itself, giving war a chance and which explains how expenditure on war can generate a visible return in the form of booty, indemnities from vanquished states or territories. Point 48 Thus the debunking, or seemingly debunking, aspect of the discourse, the opium wars are recognized to have been wars of extortion, self-financing and even showing a profit. But what were the consequences of such extortion for the people subject to it? The crisis exposed by the country's inability to defend itself against external aggression played a prominent role in causing the Taiping Rebellion, 1851-64, which not coincidentally put the fight against opium on the agenda. This was a prolonged, extremely bloody civil war. The food situation deteriorated and hunger became the daily lot of a huge mass of people. Furthermore, the West set a fashion in Asia. The Japanese ended up copying everything, from Western clothes and hairstyles to the European practice of colonizing foreign countries. 49 new wars of extortion occurred, the indemnity wrested from China by Japan in 1895, amounted to more than three times total Japanese military spending in that year and around double the cost of the war. 55 years later, 11 Western empires, including the United Kingdom and the United States 51 launched a punitive expedition against the boxers. And the first anti-colonialist movements, which ended with the extraction of a new heavy indemnity 52 even more exorbitant than the previous ones. Is there, then, a link between such extortion and the drastic decline in the standard of living of the Chinese people? It is at this point, 
a crucial moment, that the debunking Ferguson is fond of disappears, in fact turning into its opposite. In his view, what has been described as China Crucified 53 was the result exclusively of an endogenous process of stagnation. In reality, as late as 1820, prior to the Opium Wars, the great Asian country boasted a GDP that amounted to 32.4% of global GDP, while Chinese life expectancy, and hence nutrition, was at roughly English levels, and so above continental ones, even in the late 1700s.54 when it was founded in 1949, the People's Republic of China was the poorest country, or among the poorest, in the world. Although confirmed by other distinguished historians, this picture is challenged by Ferguson. What leaps to the eye once more is the poverty and inadequacy of the conceptual apparatus of the British historian, who sticks to a heavily economistic approach. The impact of the Opium Wars cannot be assessed exclusively in terms of the material devastation visited by them and the exorbitant indemnity in which they ended. It is not even enough to introduce into the calculation the territorial amputations and the large-scale destruction and theft of priceless artworks. It is evident that the forced introduction of opium had a devastating impact on Chinese society, which was felt for a long time. Even so, let us confine our attention to the economy in the strict sense and the data reported by Ferguson, by 1820 US per capita GDP was twice that of China, by 1870 it was nearly five times greater, by 1913 the ratio was nearly 10 to 155 it is legitimate to ask what contribution the wars of aggression and rapine made to the gap between China and the USA and the West as a whole. But it would seem difficult to deny any connection between the phenomena. Yet this is precisely what Ferguson argues. By a kind of miracle, wars which, as he concedes, significantly benefited the aggressor did no real harm to the aggressed. This modus operandi also emerges in connection with the encounter clash between the British Empire and India. Let us read Ferguson again. The kind of world war that was the Seven Years' War decided one thing irrevocably. India would be British, not French. And that gave Britain what for nearly 200 years would be both a huge market for British trade and an inexhaustible reservoir of military manpower. India was much more than the jewel in the crown. Literally and metaphorically, it was a whole diamond mine 56 thus is reconstructed and underscored the enormous advantage that Britain secured with the conquest of India. But how were things for the subjugated people? In 1835, the Governor-General reported to London on the consequences of the destruction of local textile handicrafts, swept aside by the major British industry, the bones of the cotton weavers are bleaching the plains of India. Point 57 The tragedy did not end there. Two years later, a famine broke out in some regions which was so terrible that, candidly stated another British source, wholly committed to celebrating the glory of the empire, British residents, could not take their evening drive on account of the smell of corpses too numerous for burial. Nor did there seem to be any improvement in the prospects for evening excursions, cholera and smallpox followed, sweeping away a multitude who had survived the dearth. Point 58 Clearly, the British Empire did not benefit India and the Indian people, in the 100 years before independence in 1947, development averaged 0.2% per year, at a time when Britain itself experienced growth almost ten times that rate. Life expectancy probably showed no improvement either, unlike Britain 59 moreover, Ferguson himself writes that in 1913 average life expectancy in England was nearly twice what it was in India. Point 60 Once again the key question arises, is there a link between the diamond mine of which the British Empire disposed, thanks to the subjugation of India, and the far from exalted condition of the Indian people? As a result of ignoring the connection, here too a seemingly critical discourse turns into its opposite, into an acritical celebration, which registers the human costs involved in building empire with imperturbable cynicism. On closer inspection, the enfant terrible of historiography proves to be an apologist or, to be more precise, the enfant terrible of the traditional apologetics engaged in transfiguring colonialism and imperialism. Ferguson and the mutilation of the whole.
In drawing up his balance sheet of Western colonialism, Ferguson rejects the habitual spatial amputation whereby, unlike Europe, the USA has nothing to do with this extended chapter of history, and rejects it to pave the way for an explicit apologia for the American empire, from the founding fathers to the present. On the other hand, in order to avoid dark clouds spoiling his apologia, he proceeds to a tacit temporal amputation of the history of Western colonialism, de facto excluding the Third Reich from it. Ferguson certainly stresses on several occasions that Germany cannot but be regarded as an integral part of the West. But when he celebrates the political and moral superiority of the West over the rest, he seems to forget that Hitler's Germany was an integral part of the West, not the rest. There can be no doubt about this affiliation, and not only, and not so much, for geographical reasons. The Third Reich admired the British and American empires, taking them as its model. Hitler repeatedly stated that it was a question of building the German Indies in Eastern Europe. Even more frequent, especially after the invasion of the Soviet Union, were comparisons with the expansion of the American colonists in the West and Far West, with the war against the Indians, the war waged on the Indians of North America. In both cases, the strongest race will be the one to triumph, the natives of Eastern Europe could not escape the fate of a radical reduction in their numbers and enslavement that awaited them, see Chapter 5, 6. The American model also exercised its fascination on Mussolini, who in November 1933, when preparations for the invasion and colonization of Ethiopia had already begun to be made, likewise paid homage to the harsh and alluring great conquest of the Far West, see Chapter 7, 2. Hence, together with the Third Reich, the fascist empire must likewise be included in a serious historical appraisal of Western colonialism. While the expansion of England was a conscious act of imitation of the Spanish Empire, which was the envy of the world 61 the empires in whose construction Nazi Germany and fascist Italy engaged, committing particularly odious crimes in the process, were a more or less conscious imitation of the British and American empires. Taken as a whole, the temporal cycle of Western colonialism commenced with the genocide of the Native Americans, summoned to replace them were the black slaves deported from Africa, and culminated in the 20th century with the attempt to enslave the Slavs and exterminate the Jews, who were regarded along with the Bolsheviks as responsible for the insane revolt of inferior races against white, Aryan, and Western supremacy. Furthermore, the empire of the rising sun should not be excluded from any historical appraisal of Western colonialism that aims to be complete and which, in formulating a moral judgment, takes account of the ethic of responsibility in the first instance. Certainly, at least prior to the mid-19th century, Japan cannot be regarded as part of the West. But another truth, brought out by numerous historians, including Ferguson, is equally clear, Japanese colonialism and imperialism simply cannot be understood without bearing in mind the model they were inspired by, namely, the European and Western model. Apologetics for the colonial tradition, and claims for the moral and political primacy of the West, are based on mutilation of the whole. In fact, the mutilation we have just noted is not the only one. Others occur, of varying kinds. Ferguson refers favorably to a young man, fresh from his first colonial war, Winston Churchill, who assigned the British Empire the glorious task of giving peace to warring tribes. Point 62 However, when the First World War broke out, in the USA the most prestigious newspapers and public opinion as a whole denounced the European powers as savage tribes incapable of understanding the cause of peace, Chapter 4, 5. Indeed, the characterization is apt, when we remember that what occurred on both sides on the Western Front was the growth of a culture of take no prisoners, who were sometimes even executed with rifle butts, and all this not only in an explosion of anger from below, but often via orders from above. Point 63 The characterization as savage tribes may well be APT. But in 1917, the United States, which decided to intervene in the war, joined them. And it was these savage tribes, European and Western, who forcibly dragged into the carnage the colonial peoples whom, according to Churchill as subscribed to by Ferguson, they had task of pacifying.
as regards the British Savage Tribe, or British Empire, it could call upon the inexhaustible reservoir of military manpower which, according to the definition by Ferguson cited above, India represented. Indeed, in the autumn of 1914, around a third of British forces in France were from India, by the end of the war more than a million Indians had served overseas. 64 many were volunteers who, in return for their sacrifice, hoped, in vain, for independence or, at any rate, self-government for their people. With them fought countless Africans, who did not nurture hopes of any kind, but who were simply forced by the colonial power to fight and to die thousands of miles from home. Or to die in their own land, but in the service of a cause that was not theirs, total British losses in East Africa were over 100,000, the vast majority black troops and porters 65. But all this was not enough for the British Empire, which also sought to obtain military manpower from the semi-colonies. The first president of the Chinese Republic that emerged from the overthrow of the Manchu dynasty recounted the answer given by him to the British consul, who was pressing for China's intervention alongside the Entente during the First World War. Two thousand years ago we discarded imperialism and advocated a policy of peace. I consider your characteristic appeal to force as extremely barbarous. Because we have advanced two thousand years beyond you and have gotten rid of the old, savage, pugnacious sentiments and have attained, a true ideal of peace, and because we hope that China will forever cherish her moral code of peace, we are not willing to enter this great conflict. Point 66. The least one can say is that the British Empire, and Western colonialism in general, can be credited with giving peace to warring tribes only by completely ignoring a major historical episode in which, along with the natural resources of the subjugated peoples, human resources were plundered and converted into cannon fodder. During the Second World War, the picture did not change, the colonial commitment to the empire proved every bit as strong as in the First World War. Two and a half million Indians fought in an army intended by Churchill to guarantee the permanence of the empire and white or western supremacy. 67. By way of conclusive proof of the mutilation of the whole picture performed by apologetics for colonialism, which today finds its champion in Ferguson, we should pose a question, can the genesis of fascism and Nazism be understood ignoring the First World War and, more generally, the scramble of the great capitalist powers for empire? As we know, total politics, a substantive synonymous with ubiquitous totalitarian regimentation, was theorized in Germany in preparation for the revanche that would enable the country defeated in the First World War to recover the colonies annexed by the victors and to build the colonial empire for which it felt the need, and claimed the right, on a much larger scale, Chapter 5, 2. In the course of this attempted revanche, something occurred that is worth reflecting on. Although expressing staunch support for the remorseless energy with which the conquest of Algeria was carried out, Tocqueville had expressed a concern, God save us from ever seeing France ruled by an officer of the Army of Africa 68 in fact, Kavanagh, the general who had no hesitation in resorting to genocidal practices to eradicate Arab resistance, was some years later the architect of the bloody, ruthless repression that mowed down the barbarians of the metropolis, the Parisian workers who had risen up demanding the right to work and to life. Notwithstanding his earlier warning, Tocqueville extended constant, unwavering support to Kavanagh. But his warning was prophetic. Over a century later, the great theoretician of the Algerian Revolution, Franz Fanon, characterized Nazism as an attempt to transform Europe, more precisely, Central Eastern Europe, into a genuine colony, Chapter 7, 1. We may venture a more general observation. On closer inspection, the history of the West as a whole can be read in the light of a principle dear to Marx, any people that oppresses another is not free. The 20th century was the century when the totalitarian domination and genocidal practices profoundly rooted in the colonial tradition erupted into the very continent from which that tradition derived, in the wake of Hitler's endeavor to build a continental empire in Central Eastern Europe subjugating, decimating and enslaving the natives who inhabited it and exterminating those, Jews and Bolsheviks, deemed responsible for the revolt of inferior races.
The fact that the central categories and keywords of Nazi ideology go back to the colonial tradition, in particular, the U.S. variant, Chapter 7, 2, should give pause for thought. Colonial peoples and peoples of colonial origin have long expressed awareness of the close link between colonial racism and the Aryan mythology dear, in particular, to Nazism. This is true, above all, of African American activists, often compelled, as Martin Luther King stressed, to confront groups of white supremacists waving swastikas. An episode that occurred in New York in these years is emblematic. Without fully appreciating its significance, Hannah Arendt reported it in a letter to Carl Jaspers on January 3, 1960, a topic has been assigned to all the final classes of New York's high schools. Imagine a way of punishing Hitler. And this is what a black girl has suggested, he should be put in a black skin and forced to live in the United States. In a spontaneous, ingenuous way, the black girl frankly imagined a sort of Lex Talionese, whereby those responsible for the Third Reich's racist violence were forced like blacks to suffer the humiliations and vexations of the regime of white supremacy tirelessly propagated, and remorselessly implemented, by them, but which in the southern USA would now rebound against them. Point 69. Even anti-Semitic racism cannot be adequately understood if it is completely disconnected from the racism affecting colonial peoples, in which the British and American empires played a vanguard role. In his way, Ferguson ends up recognizing this when he writes, since so few Germans emigrated to tropical countries, they were more likely to apply imported theories of social Darwinism and racial hygiene to Jews, the nearest identifiable alien race, than to Africans or Asians 70. The Third Reich's connection with the colonial tradition is strong and patent. After the Fuhrer, perhaps the regime's major figure was Hermann Goering, who may be regarded as the initiator of the concentration camp system. Yet his father, Heinrich, was the first imperial commissioner for German Southwest Africa 71 and it was there that Germany began to experiment with the system. Survivors of the campaign of extermination launched against the Herero by General von Trotha were imprisoned in concentration camps, where men, women, and children were herded to be eliminated through work.72 as well as being utilized as rapidly consumed work tools, the natives were employed as guinea pigs for eugenicist experiments, conducted under the direction of Theodore Mollison and Eugene Fisher, Joseph Menchel's teachers. With these teachers behind him, the future ideologue and organizer of the Third Reich's machinery of extermination joined the SA in 1933. It would appear that the original brown shirts worn by Hitler's squads were remnants of the uniforms worn by colonial troops in East Africa. 73. However, when it began to construct its concentration camp system in Africa, Wilhelm II's Germany had precedents and models to draw on. Let us see what happened in the British Empire, availing ourselves of Ferguson's reconstruction, to deprive the Boers of supplies from their farms, their wives and children had been driven from their homes and herded in concentration camps, where conditions were atrocious, at this stage, roughly one in three inmates was dying because of poor sanitation and disease 74 rather than the Herero, the Boers called to mind the American colonists who, in their struggle against the central government, presumed to dispose at will of the natives, like human livestock owned by them. But it remains the case that we cannot come to grips with the Third Reich without coming to grips with the history of colonialism as a whole, with its terrible charge of violence, which sometimes even ended up striking sections of the self-styled master race. From the Opium Wars to the Rape of Nanking. However, Ferguson's main concern is to differentiate beneficent colonialism and imperialism from the Maleficent variety. He effectively describes the murderous orgy that visited China and, in particular, Nanking in the 1930s. The aggressors engaged in a killing competition. In Nanking, between 260,000 and 300,000 non-combatants were killed. The Japanese troops amused themselves assaulting women and practiced sadism on men, some were buried alive or covered in petrol and set alight, a few were hung by their tongues on metal hooks. Point 75 Here is the British historian's conclusion. This was imperialism at its very worst. But it was Japanese imperialism, not British.
the rape of Nanking reveals precisely what the leading alternative to British rule in Asia stood for. But it was also the collision between an empire that had some conception of human rights and one that regarded alien races as no better than swine. In the words of Lt. Col. Ryakichi Tanaka, director of the Japanese Secret Service in Shanghai, we can do anything to such creatures. By the 1930s many people in Britain had got into the habit of rubbishing the empire. But the rise of the Japanese Empire in Asia during that decade showed that the alternatives to British rule were not necessarily more benign. There were degrees of imperialism, and in its brutality toward conquered peoples Japan's empire went beyond anything the British had ever done. Point 76. This passage starts with an observation that is obvious, even banal, it is always useful and appropriate to apply the art of distinction. Compared with their competitors, both the Third Reich and the Empire of the Rising Sun appeared on the historical scene late. Because partition of the world had already been largely accomplished, they were led to target peoples of established or old and antique civilization, who could be reduced to the condition of savage tribes only through a massive dose of supplementary violence and brutality. They embarked on the work of colonial subjugation at a time when the anti-colonial revolution was already underway. In such circumstances, the barbarism of imperialism obviously underwent further escalation. However, even accepting the distinction between the British Empire and the Empire of the Rising Sun, it is not clear why an Asian country like China, of continental dimensions and antique civilization, had to choose between them. We know that the Japanese Empire sought to learn, and did indeed learn, from its British counterpart. If we wish to reconstruct the process of ideological preparation of the rape of Nanking, more than a few pages should be devoted to Great Britain and the West as a whole. At the start of the Second Opium War, which ended with the sacking and burning of the splendid Summer Palace, John Stuart Mill called for the invading army to teach the Chinese barbarians a harsh lesson. It was not appropriate to quibble about formalities, appeals to humanity and Christianity in favor of rough Ians, and to international law in favor of peoples who recognize no laws of war at all, were ridiculous. Point 77. Some decades later, in 1900, a new, more massive punitive expedition was launched against China. Haranguing German troops preparing to depart for Asia, Wilhelm II left them in no doubts about the modalities that should govern the repression of the Boxer Rebellion and the lesson to be taught the Chinese people as a whole, give the world an example of virility and discipline. No pardon will be given, and no prisoners will be taken. Anyone who falls into your hands falls to your sword. Make the name German remembered in China for a thousand years so that no Chinaman will ever again dare to squint at a German 78 and indeed, let us take a glance at the sequel to the defeat of the barbarians. There then began systematic carnage and sacking, which went far beyond the excesses of the boxers. In Beijing, thousands of men were massacred in a savage orgy of violence, women and whole families committed suicide so as not to suffer being disinured, the whole city was sacked, the imperial palace was occupied and robbed of the bulk of its treasures. A similar situation obtained in Tientsin and Beiting. Punitive expeditions were undertaken in the rural areas of Zhili where missionaries had been attacked. Foreign soldiers razed entire villages to the ground and spared nothing. In Manchuria, where the Russians were responsible for the pacification, the atrocities were on the same scale. In reprisal for the shots fired on the city of Blagovshchensk, thousands of Chinese, men, women, and children, had their throats cut and their bodies were thrown into the Heilongjiang.79. The rape of Nanking involved horror on a larger scale and even more unbridled barbarism. But it was 37 years earlier that imperialist Japan had proved its mettle in China, participating in the punitive expedition of 1900 alongside Britain, the USA, France, Germany, Russia, Italy, and Austria-Hungary. Its horror did not elicit a wave of indignation in the West. In fact, the French general H.N. Frey credited it with having for the first time translated into reality the dream of idealist politicians, a United States of the civilized world A.D. It was Lenin, the great critic of imperialism, who reported and ridiculed this assessment.
he denounced the colonialist violence inflicted on the unarmed Chinese populace, who were drowned or killed, with no holding back from the slaughter of women and children, not to speak of the looting of palaces, homes and shops. Russian soldiers, and the invaders generally, had attacked like savage beasts, burning down whole villages, shooting, bayoneting, and drowning in the Amur River unarmed inhabitants, their wives and their children. Yet such infamy had been celebrated as a civilizing mission by the dominant classes, the press that kowtows to them and, ultimately, by much, or even most, of public opinion, not only Russian, but Western in general. Point 81. In any event, for having participated on an equal footing with the European or Western powers in the punitive expedition against the boxers, and made themselves jointly responsible for the horror, Japan was co-opted into the exclusive club of great powers, whose right to colonize and civilize barbarians was recognized. Point 82 This change was subsequently formally sealed, by the Anglo-Japanese Treaty Japan had become a great power, and so, in the statistics of the Dutch East Indies, had to figure among the European and not among the Asian states 83. The First World War then intervened. The Empire of the Rising Sun fought on the side of the Entente, which recognized its right to inherit defeated Germany's colonial possessions in China. While imperialist and militarist Japan could now boast equal dignity with the great capitalist powers of the West, in Western eyes China remained Asiatic and barbarous and thus part of the colonial or colonizable world, even though it had rid itself of the Manchu dynasty and constituted itself as a democratic republic in the meantime. This is the starting point for understanding the Japanese Empire's subsequent attempt to subject the most populous country on earth to its rule. The rape of Nanking, and the other infamies bound up with it, cannot be separated from the history of imperialism as a whole, a history in which the great Western powers enjoyed a position of absolute preeminence. Basically, as Ferguson himself acknowledges, the Japanese merely inserted themselves into the privileged position hitherto occupied by the British. 84 But it was the West that had much earlier defined the pyramid of peoples and races, the hierarchy on the basis of which peoples and races on a higher rung were granted the right to subjugate and, if needs be, drastically decimate people and races of inferior rank. The only thing we need add is that the processes of co option were inherently fragile. While the Japanese treated the Chinese, degraded to the status of an inferior race, with particular ferocity, they in turn suffered a process of racialization by the USA during the Second World War, which occasionally went as far as envisaging a kind of final solution of the Japanese question, Chapter 4, 4. Oblivion of History and Geopolitics and Manichaean Essentialism Ferguson does not tire of counterposing the West to the rest, a kind of worthless appendix of the genuinely civilized world. The contrast is primarily developed on the basis of a reading of the history of the American continent, independence from Spain left South America with an enduring legacy of conflict, poverty and inequality. Why did capitalism and democracy fail to thrive in Latin America? Why, when I once asked a colleague at Harvard if he thought Latin America belonged to the West, was he unsure? Why? In short, was Bolivar not the Latin Washington? 85 The questions are peremptory, are they correctly formulated? We have seen Hamilton and Tocqueville stressing that what facilitated the USA's peaceful development and liberal order was a favorable geopolitical context. On the American continent, it did not have great powers on its borders or in its vicinity, while the Atlantic protected it from potential attempts at revenge by the defeated enemy. Chapter 2 10. The same conclusion is reached by Hegel in his lectures on the philosophy of history, there is no neighboring state in America with which the United States could have the kind of relationship which prevails among the European nations, a state which they would have to view with distrust and against which they would have to maintain a standing army. Point 86 Contrasting North America and Latin America in the context of a comparison that totally ignores history and geopolitics, Ferguson neglects the Convergent lesson of the three authors cited. The genesis and development of the United States profoundly altered the geopolitical framework and created that situation, the vicinity of a powerful and fearsome, if not threatening, state. 
Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of history make a further observation. Over and above the favorable geopolitical situation, an important role was played in the USA by the outlet of colonization, by this means, the principal source of discontent has been removed, and the continued existence of the present state of civil society is guaranteed. A safety valve of this kind was wanting in Europe, with profound consequences, if the ancient forests of Germany still existed, the French Revolution would never have occurred. Or it would have occurred in a less radical, less tormented fashion. Generally speaking, it would have been easier to defuse social tension and political unrest. Given the radical difference of geopolitical contexts, a comparison between the free states of North America and the countries of Europe is therefore impossible. Point 87 This represents a refutation of Aunt La Lettre of Ferguson's abstract comparativism. The full implications of Hegel's second remark should be noted. Colonization, the expropriation, deportation, and decimation of the natives, made it possible for poor whites to access property, so that the reigning political power in the USA, already sheltered from attacks from without, did not have to fear the threat harbored by a bitter internal social conflict. In other words, the liberal state, for the white community, was only one side of the coin. The flip side took the form of terror against the natives, who were constantly exposed to the threat of expropriation, deportation, and decimation. Hegel's analysis can be extended, the institution of slavery enabled iron control over the dangerous classes at the point of production. And once again, social stability and the rule of law, for the white community, was the flip side of a complete lack of rights for slaves, and blacks in general. However, in negatively contrasting the South with the North of the American continent, Ferguson focuses exclusively on one side of the coin, the liberty enjoyed by the white community in the British colonies and then in the USA, while the reverse side is persistently ignored and repressed. The remarkable thing is that the latter ends up emerging from the British historian's own descriptions. Let us first deal with the lot of the natives. George Washington was appalled when the Indians were effectively confirmed in their lands by the Royal Proclamation of 1763. He thought this was an expedient to keep them on board during the Seven Years' War. 88 The leader of the rebellion against the London government had no doubt that expropriation and repression were the inevitable fate awaiting the natives. In short, in South America the Indians worked the land. In North America they lost it. 89 To be precise, it was not only the land. In 1650 the American Indians had accounted for around 80 percent of the population in both North America and South America, including also Brazil. By 1825, however, the proportions were radically different. In Spanish America indigenous people still accounted for 59 percent of the population. In Brazil, however, the figure was down to 21 per center while in North America it was below 4 per cent 90. As regards the USA and Canada, what, in addition to immigration, yielded this result was the tenacious, consistent pursuit of a policy aimed at getting rid of the dross represented by the Native Americans. Let us now contrast the fate of blacks in the south and north of the American continent, still availing ourselves of Ferguson's reconstruction. The lot of slaves in pre-revolutionary Latin America was not wholly wretched. Royal and religious authority could and did intervene to mitigate the condition of the slaves, just as it could limit other private property rights. Beginning in Brazil, it became the norm in Latin America for slaves to have their own plots of land. In North America slave owners felt empowered to treat all their chattels as they saw fit, regardless of whether they were human beings or plots of land. A Virginian law of 1669 declared it no felony if a master killed his slave. A South Carolinian law of 1726 explicitly stated that slaves were chattels, later chattels personal, point 91. Mere article of property in the North, in the South the slave could even be a property owner. Partial and contested in the South, the dehumanization of slaves was consummated in the North. Things did not change with the birth of the USA. Before we celebrate the long-run success of the British model of colonization in North America,
we need to acknowledge that in one peculiar aspect it was in no way superior to Latin America. Especially after the American Revolution, the racial division between white and black hardened. The U.S. Constitution, for all its many virtues, institutionalized that division by accepting the legitimacy of slavery, the original sin of the New Republic. Point 92. Once again, the flip side of American liberty is delineated with the utmost clarity. In addition to the expropriation, deportation, and decimation of the natives, it comprised the advent of the vilest slavery that ever saw the sun, to quote the English abolitionist John Wesley once again, and its consecration by the Constitution. This constituted the emergence of a veritable racial state. There is no doubt that the line of demarcation between whites and races deemed inferior was much clearer in the North than the South. Not by chance, laws criminalizing miscegenation were in force in the North and survived well beyond the abolition of black slavery, as late as 1913, 28 states retained such statutes, 10 of them had gone so far as to make the prohibition on miscegenation constitutional. There was even an attempt, in December 1912, to amend the U.S. Constitution so as to prohibit miscegenation forever. 93 In fact, in the southern USA the racial state survived the collapse of the Third Reich, as late as 1967, 16 states still had laws prohibiting racial intermarriage. 94. The empirical details recorded by the historian utterly contradict the conclusion stated by the theoretician of the absolute moral and political primacy of the North of the American continent, and the West as a whole. In the latter guise, Ferguson contrasts the inequality obtaining in Latin America with equality in the British colonies and, subsequently, the USA.95 but it is manifest that in the second case the relationship between whites and races of color was characterized by an extremely pronounced and tenacious inequality. In Ferguson's view, the Constitution of 1787, which laid the basis for the Civil War, is to be regarded as the most impressive piece of political institution building in all history. 96 for U.S. abolitionists, by contrast, it was a tool of Satan sanctioning slavery in its most abject form, and establishing an absolute, insurmountable inequality between the different races, it destroyed the very unity of the human race asserted by Christianity. 97. From the value of equality, let us pass to liberty. In this case too, the empirical details reported by the historian are eloquent. Slaves on Latin American plantations could more easily secure manumission than those on Virginian tobacco farms. In Bahia slaves themselves purchased half of all manumissions. By 1872 three quarters of blacks and mulattoes were free. In Cuba and Mexico a slave could even have his price declared and buy his freedom in installments. 98. Unlike in the North, then, the barrier separating the slave from the possession of liberty was not insurmountable. Thus far we have the historian's reconstruction. But now the ideologue intervenes, repeating that in any event it was North America, an integral part of the West, in fact, its contemporary vanguard, which embodied liberty. This does not mean that every problem has been resolved, the most successful revolution ever made in the name of liberty was a revolution made in considerable measure by the owners of slaves, at a time when the movement for the abolition of slavery was already well underway on both sides of the Atlantic. And so, we are dealing with a paradox. 99 but resort to this category is certainly insufficient to dispel the major shadow cast over American liberty by the fate reserved for blacks, and Native Americans. All the more so because the paradox might be differently, or conversely, formulated. Owners of slaves, and of land taken from the natives fraudulently and violently, were the authors of a rebellion against the London government who paradoxically waved the banner of liberty. If, as emerges from Ferguson's formulation, the paradox refers to the secondary aspect of a blatantly contradictory admixture, does it consist in the reality of the violence perpetrated against entire peoples or in the ideology whereby the reality and the violence were legitimized? Even if we agree to overlook the inferior races, and focus exclusively on the white community, it is not logical to identify a country which, sanctioning or tolerating bans on miscegenation,
intervened in the most private individual sphere as an embodiment of liberty. Let us be clear, it is not a question of reversing the result of the comparison between the south and north of the American continent in favor of the former. It is a question of highlighting the fact that the empirical evidence adduced by the British historian utterly contradicts the a prioristic thesis stated by him. Above all, it is a question of challenging a comparison between different societies and cultures represented in essentialist fashion, arbitrarily smoothing out the contradictory aspects of each of them, and ignoring history and geopolitics. Having celebrated the North by contrast with the South of the American continent, Ferguson compares the West with the rest, invariably to the greater glory of the former and the eternal shame of the latter. We are already familiar with the methodology. In fact, it is even more arbitrary now. The West is referred to in general, but no mention is made of the Third Reich. What is contrasted with the rest is the liberal West. But history and geopolitics remain absent for the most part. Let us seek to make good this lacuna. From the late 17th century onwards, liberalism asserted itself in two countries, Britain and the USA, which could avail themselves of the outlet of colonization, to use Hegel's terminology, and were sheltered from the threats faced by the continental European states. It should be added that it was no accident if the glorious revolution followed Britain's victory first over Spain and then over France, while the revolt of the American colonies began only after France's defeat in the Seven Years' War. In other words, both liberal revolutions presupposed a marked improvement in the geopolitical situation. As regards continental Europe, we can distinguish two phases. After the defeat of the Turks at the gates of Vienna in 1683, and the fading of the Ottoman threat, the liberal order began to enjoy widespread support in continental Europe itself. The second phase was the so-called Hundred Years' Peace, from the end of the Napoleonic Wars to the outbreak of the First World War. This was the period when liberalism also achieved victory politically in the most advanced countries of continental Europe. Further proof of the thesis just formulated is to hand. Just as the liberal institutions deriving from the turning point of 1789 did not withstand the war in which revolutionary France became embroiled, so, with the explosion of the great historical crisis of the first half of the 20th century, the liberal institutions that had flourished in continental Europe during the Hundred Years' Peace were overwhelmed or experienced a dramatic crisis. Even countries enjoying a more or less insular position, like Britain and the USA, suffered a process of attrition at times, with an unprecedented intensification of executive power. War and states of emergency are not conducive to the maintenance of the principle of the limitation of power. And the more devastating and threatening to national sovereignty the war, the more acute is the state of emergency and the lower the chances of the rule of law surviving. Hence to place the colonialist great powers and countries that suffered their aggression, or the threat of it, on the same footing evinces a colossal methodological naivete, when it does not derive from a calculation informed by cynical realpolitik. It was precisely the former countries that rendered the advent of liberal institutions, of which they claimed to be the champions, impossible in the latter. In the U.S. Constitution itself, which Ferguson celebrates as an insuperable model, it is clearly written, Section 9, that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus can be suspended when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. Ferguson takes no account of any of this when he celebrates the West's secular primacy in every respect over China. However, in this case too, what refute him are the facts he records. Following the catastrophe of the Opium Wars and the punitive expedition against the boxers, the great Asian country seemed in the early 20th century to be one of those relatively decentralized entities whose dissolution was anticipated by many Westerners. Point 100 The situation certainly did not improve with the collapse of the Manchu dynasty and the advent of a republic that looked to the West as a model politically as well. The extent of China's disintegration in the 1920s is hard to overstate. An objective, long standing fact also has to be appreciated with more than 50 ethnic groups, 11 or more language groups still identifiable today, 
inhabitants even of neighboring villages could speak mutually incomprehensible dialects. 101 This was a situation that could only be dealt with by a strong central government, whose emergence was made impossible by the clashes between feuding warlords. Did the West at least seek to encourage the advent of democracy? Nothing of the kind, although British politicians seemed willing to make concessions on the issue of extraterritoriality, the proverbial men on the spot continued to act as if China were merely an extension of the Raj 102. In addition, the threat of a different imperialism began to emerge, the line that the Japanese now took was that China was on the verge of disintegration. 103. The foundation of the People's Republic of China, following an epic national liberation struggle, certainly did not result in an immediate end to the situation of danger. To end the Korean War and teach the country that had challenged U.S. hegemony in Asia a memorable lesson, U.S. General MacArthur proposed that up to 50 atomic bombs should be dropped on Chinese cities, and the author of this proposal, far from being isolated, paraded in New York saluted and acclaimed by a crowd of up to 7 million. It was a triumph worthy of a Caesar 104 What sense does it make to criticize a country threatened with nuclear destruction on this occasion, and again in subsequent years, for failure to achieve the rule of law? The country whence the threat of nuclear destruction issued itself experienced a period not free of institutional unrest, the year 1951 was perhaps the only moment in its history that the American Republic came close to meeting the fate of the Roman Republic and falling under the rule of a Caesar played by General MacArthur. 105. In reality, although protected by the Atlantic and the Pacific, every time it has rightly or wrongly felt itself imperiled, the North American Republic has proceeded to a more or less drastic reinforcement of executive power and to more or less heavy restrictions on freedom of association and expression. This applies to the years immediately following the French Revolution, when its devotees on American soil were hit by the Alien and Sedition Acts, to the Civil War, the First World War, the Great Depression, the Second World War and the Cold War. Even in our day, the sequel to the attack of September 11, 2001 was the opening of a concentration camp at Guantanamo, where detainees have been imprisoned without trial, and without even being informed of a specific charge, regardless of age. However terrible, the threat of terrorism is minor compared with that of invasion and military occupation, not to mention nuclear destruction. Property, liberty, competition, and unthinking use of categories. We can readily understand why, in depicting the rest in negative terms, Ferguson particularly targets China, whose rapid rise threatens the economic primacy of the West. But here too the contrast between multifaceted empirical description and ideological conclusion, Manichaean in character, is arresting. Is there anything to be admired in the millenarian civilization of the great Asian country? Referring to the voyages of geographical exploration, the British historian compares the Portuguese, hence Western, Vasco da Gama with the Chinese Zheng He. A streak of ruthlessness, indeed, of downright brutality can be detected in the former that is largely absent from the latter. 106 Hence it was the West's geographical explorations in particular that seemed to have resulted in the annexation of continents and discovered lands, and the subjugation and even enslavement and decimation of the peoples inhabiting them. Let us now see what happened after the emancipation, partial or sometimes only formal, of black slaves in the European colonies and the USA, comparable numbers of indentured laborers from India and China were also on the move in the 1900s, their condition only marginally better than slavery, to work in plantations and mines owned and managed by Europeans, and, in fact, US citizens too, 0.107 hence it was Westerners who enslaved Chinese, and Indians, not vice versa. In the light of all this, anyone who sought to credit the West with some absolute moral and political supremacy would be demonstrating an incapacity for logical judgment and moral hypocrisy. However, Ferguson's conclusion is exactly the opposite. In his view, it would be absurd relativism to cast doubt on the permanent moral and political primacy of Western civilization, no previous civilization had ever achieved such dominance as the West achieved over the rest, largely controlling the planet militarily and economically. 108 That is to say, regardless of the terrible practices it often engaged in, 
colonial expansionism is regarded as proof of the intrinsic, permanent superiority of the West, and rejection of relativism takes the form of prostration before the law of the jungle and social Darwinism. Even more problematic are the very categories in which the dominant ideology stages the comparison between the different civilizations. According to Ferguson, what explains the irresistible rise of the West, and its moral and political primacy, was, inter alia, its scrupulous respect for property rights. Yet we have seen the British historian acknowledging that the process of outright dehumanization of black slaves in the north of the American continent resulted from the disappearance of any checks on the exercise of private property rights, including property in human livestock. Security of property rights is not in fact synonymous with respect for individual freedom. Far from being a site where all individuals met freely as sellers and buyers of commodities, the liberal market was for centuries a site of exclusion and dehumanization. In the past, the ancestors of today's black citizens were commodities, not autonomous buyers and sellers. And for centuries the market even functioned as an instrument of terror, rather than the whip, what imposed total obedience on slaves was the threat of their sale, as a commodity to be exchanged on the market, Separately from other family members.109 indentured white servants were long sold and bought on the market as well, and thereby condemned to a fate not very different from that of black slaves. And in the name of the market, workers' combinations were repressed and economic and social rights ignored and denied, with the consequent commodification of essential aspects of the human personality and human dignity, health, education, etc. In extreme cases, the superstitious cult of the market has sealed enormous tragedies, like that which saw the United Kingdom condemn an enormous mass of concrete, Irish, individuals to death by starvation in 1847. On the other hand, has the West truly distinguished itself by scrupulous respect for property rights? Marx's opinion on this subject is interesting. They the bourgeoisie and the West are the defenders of property, but did any revolutionary party ever originate agrarian revolutions like those in Bengal, in Madras, and in Bombay? While they prat in Europe about the inviolable sanctity of the national debt, did they not confiscate in India the dividends of the Reyes, who had invested their private savings in the company's own funds, 110? And it was not only a question of ownership of the soil. Following the Second Opium War, Anglo-French troops set fire to the Summer Palace in Beijing, acquiring priceless items which even today the looters refuse to return. Let us now concentrate exclusively on the logical aspect of the nexus between property and liberty established by Ferguson. Having underscored the merits of the 1787 US Constitution for having promoted a single market, the rule of law, and so forth, he continues. At root it was all about property. And in these terms Washington was one of those hard-nosed men who did well out of the War of Independence accumulating new land taken from the natives. Nothing could better illustrate the tightness of the nexus between land and liberty in the early history of the United States. In South America the Indians worked the land. In North America they lost it. Point one eleven. Is this observation proof of the thesis cherished by the British historian or its refutation? On the one hand, land, seized from the natives, allowed the white community to defuse social conflict and consolidate liberal institutions. On the other hand, the land originally possessed by the natives consigned them to a fate of expropriation, deportation, and decimation, that is, a complete lack of liberty and rights. Similarly unthought out is another group of categories, competition, respect for individual dignity, individualism, utilized by the dominant ideology to celebrate the West. 112 It is right to emphasize with Ferguson that Europe achieved its economic and technological development thanks to competition not only between individuals, but also between the states into which, unlike China, it was divided. But there is another side to the coin. The furious competition between different states provoked the catastrophe of two world wars, and it was in reaction to this that the process of European unification was subsequently promoted. Even if we stick to competition between individuals within a country, 
the result of the comparison between the different civilizations is much more problematic than the British historian Imagines. In the Europe of the Ancien Regime, where the hereditary aristocracy wielded power, supporters of Enlightenment looked to China with admiration and envy. In that Confucian society, where learning was the key to advancement 113 public competitions were used to select public servants. Hence a preeminent role was played not by supposed nobility of blood, but by competition and individual merit. If we do not confine ourselves to including only the white community, the result of the comparison proves quite unexpected. In the USA, racial affiliation was long, very long, in the South as late as the mid-20th century, the decisive criterion determining the fate of the individual. Did competition and individualism play a more important role in the North American Republic or Confucian China? Rather than opting for one of the horns of the dilemma, and allowing ourselves to become imprisoned in a schema of the clash of civilizations with tendencies to fundamentalism, it is better to apply the principle of the circulation of thought between different cultures. 114 Once the global colonial system and, in the USA, the racial state and regime of white supremacy had been defeated, thanks to the anti-colonial revolutions and the struggles of peoples of colonial origin, it can be said. That competition and individualism came to fruition in the West. But the fact remains that, if by individualism is meant recognition of the dignity of individuals in their universality, it cannot be conceived without the contribution made by the challenge of cultures and peoples foreign to the West and often in conflict with it. We arrive at the same complex conclusion if we compare areas situated within the same civilization. As regards the West, which demonstrated greater individualism. The Europe that constructed the welfare state, or the USA which mostly condemned it as synonymous with insane collectivism. The answer to the question is quite the opposite of obvious, if individualism means concern for the fate of the concrete individual. In any event, whatever the answer, it is important not to lose sight of significant material circumstances. In the late 19th century, Bismarck in Germany sought to avert the feared socialist revolution through a reform from above that introduced elements of the welfare state. In the same years, across the Atlantic, social conflict was diffused differently, and the welfare state assumed a peculiar form, government support for colonists settled in the far west and realizing the American dream at the expense of the natives. Transfiguration of the West and Delegitimation of the Anti-Colonial Revolutions Bound up with transfiguration of the West is delegitimation of the anti-colonial revolutions. What is the sense in rebelling against a superior civilization, whose expansion was the result of a conversion achieved ultimately more by the word than by the sword? 115 In reality, on other occasions Ferguson is compelled to acknowledge a different, opposed truth, the ultima ratio of the Western empires was, of course, force, even in the 20th century, the Western powers had no desire to relinquish their mastery over Asia's peoples and resources. 116 The contradictions accumulate. We have seen the British historian draw attention to the bestial speech in which Wilhelm II harangued the German soldiers about to embark on repressing the Boxer Rebellion. But now that undertaking becomes the expedition to relieve Beijing. 117 When it prevails, the apologetic concern works miracles, to the point of converting a sword into a word. Already stripped of historical legitimacy, the anti-colonial revolutions are marked by economic failure, in fact, by failure tout court. To prove this thesis, statistical data is piled up and put on display. 118 But tables and percentages are of little use if the meaning of the categories of failure and anti-colonial revolution is not clarified first. This might seem to be a polemical remark, but let us start by reflecting on the second category. On the one hand, Ferguson stresses the imperial origins of the United States 119 and, as we know, defines the founding fathers of the USA as self-confident imperialists. On the other, he writes that of course, the American political system had also been the product of a revolt against imperial rule. 120 Can these assertions be reconciled? Were the second of Ferguson's contradictory assertions to be correct, history would contain at least one instance of a shiningly successful anti-imperial and anti-colonial revolution, namely, 
that resulting in the enactment of the 1787 Constitution, the most impressive piece of political institution building in all history, and the foundation of a country which subsequently became an economic, technological, and military superpower. In reality, as emerges from Ferguson's own account, the colonial peoples on the American continent found their most determined and dangerous enemies precisely in the founding fathers of the North American Republic. The latter wanted to rid themselves of the restrictions on the expropriation and deportation of the natives imposed by the London government. As regards the blacks, it was the colonists who came to power via the War of Independence who regarded and treated slaves as sheer chattels and put a constitutional seal on this condition and, more generally, on the racial state. 121 In any event, the abolition of slavery in the USA occurred three decades later than it did in the British colonies, from the point of view of most African Americans, American independence postponed emancipation by at least a generation. Nor was independence good news for the Native Americans 122 The rebellion by the British colonists in America in the late 18th century can be assimilated to the secessions, or attempts at secession, made shortly after the mid-20th century by French colonists in Algeria and British colonists in Rhodesia. In the first case, it was a question of sweeping away the obstacles to the process of colonization erected by central government, in the other two, of blocking at any price the decolonization that central government felt compelled to initiate. All three instances involved movements whose protagonists were the most fanatical supporters of colonial expansionism and rule. Having clarified this point, we may now deal with the problem of the failure for which Ferguson reproaches anti-colonial revolutions, and confront it in the case of genuine anti-colonial revolutions. It is appropriate to start with the major upheaval of which the blacks of San Domingo Haiti were the protagonists between the late 18th century and the start of the 19th. This is a historical episode that can be directly contrasted with the one resulting in the foundation of the USA. The latter involved the consummate dehumanization of black slaves, who by contrast rebelled on San Domingo, giving birth to the first country, in the Western Hemisphere, to be free of the infamy of slavery. While the North American Republic accelerated and aggravated the ongoing tragedy of the natives, the ex-slaves who had come to power changed San Domingo's name to Haiti, referring to the island's pre-Columban past and thereby paying tribute to the victims of the discovery conquest of America. Is the anti-colonial revolution we are discussing to be regarded as a failure or success? There is no doubt that San Domingo Haiti did not succeed either in achieving economic development, or in furnishing itself with a stable political setup, and in this respect the failure is undeniable. Internationally, however, without the rebellion of the black slaves led by Toussaint L. Ovicha, we cannot understand the abolition of slavery either in Britain's colonies or in Latin America. Nor can we understand the second, definitive abolition of slavery in the French colonies following the 1848 revolution. In other words, we are dealing with an imposing process of emancipation, in which case it is decidedly problematic to speak of failure. In any event, those who claim to cherish the cause of liberty should not simplistically liquidate an essential chapter in the history of freedom as a failure. Around a century and a half later, another great anti-colonial revolution developed in China. With its success in 1949, it imparted crucial impetus to the anti-colonialist dynamic globally. Subsequently, after a laborious learning process marked by tragic pages, the country deriving from this revolution achieved extraordinary economic success and thereby encouraged other countries with a colonial or semi-colonial past, after having liberated themselves from politico-military domination, to jettison economic dependency. This is such a great success that Ferguson himself is obliged to register the decline of the West and the American Empire, or the termination of the historical cycle that began with the discovery conquest of the New World. It is such a great success that it neutralizes the success achieved by the West during the Cold War, thus was the supposed triumph of the West in 1989 revealed to be an illusion 123. But all this does not prevent the champion of philo-colonialist revisionism from drawing a caricature of the anti-colonial revolutions, and their leaders. Take the case of Cuba, 
informally an American dependency since the time of Theodore Roosevelt 124 who has been characterized by an eminent U.S. historian as a herald of modern American militarism and imperialism and also a touch of racism, and even been compared to Hitler by other, no less prestigious U.S. scholars. 125 In 1959, the independence movement, which had virtually a century of history behind it, achieved victory under the leadership of Fidel Castro. But a mere three years later, the old masters sought revenge, the invasion of the Bay of Pigs. Following the abject failure of this endeavor, a smarting Kennedy had reverted to a policy of dirty tricks aimed at destabilizing and perhaps even assassinating Castro. Is this a condemnation of U.S. imperialism? Not a bit of it. Ferguson expresses his dismay that the invasion was inadequately supported from the air. And to think that a few years earlier a coup d'etat promoted and supported by the USA had successfully overthrown the democratic government of Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala. So the Cuban Revolution was a grave setback for the American anti-communist strategy, undoing at a stroke the success of the Guatemalan coup. Despite repeated attempts, the CIA could not pull off the same trick in Havana 126. Was the defeat suffered by a formidable superpower proof of the historical legitimacy and wide social base of support for the Cuban Revolution, or at least for its leader, who also proved to be independent of Moscow? Ferguson has nothing but contempt for the intended victim of Kennedy's dirty tricks. During the Missile Crisis of 1962, Castro adopted his intransigent attitude fueled by sausages and beer, he was Pinocchio, a puppet without strings. Far from being an isolated case, the Cuba leader represents the prototype of the leaders of anti-colonialist countries and movements. In the so-called Cold War, the real and bloody Third World War was in fact fought by the likes of Castro, in the Third World itself. 127. As we can see, talk about the economic failure of the anti-colonial revolutions is simply a smokescreen. In reality, what they are criticized for is their political orientation. Why, asks Ferguson, were such revolutions fascinated with the communist model, drawing inspiration from Lenin, Stalin, and Mao? 128 The answer to this question is not far to seek. Asia and, above all, Africa were still largely dominated by countries like Britain and France, which, to bolster their rule, had no hesitation in resorting to indiscriminate repression and even genocidal practices. But why? presses Ferguson, were the anti-colonial revolutions not inspired by the American Revolution and by Washington, Jefferson, and Madison, 129 for a while President Arbenz in Guatemala did indeed refer to the North American Republic, prior to being overthrown by the CIA to make way for a dictatorship that was later guilty of genocide against the Maya, suspected of being excessively inclined to subversion. At all events, it should not be difficult to answer Ferguson's question. He it is who characterizes the Founding Fathers as expansionist and imperialist, who stresses that at times they were about the wealthiest people in the world 130, and that they derived their wealth from land taken from the natives and the reduction of blacks to human livestock. It is the British historian who records that, by dint of the Monroe Doctrine and its privileged geopolitical situation, the USA in the late 19th century regarded itself as practically sovereign on this continent, in the Western Hemisphere, and acted accordingly. 131 In any case, it is all the more remarkable to criticize the anti colonial revolutions for not looking to the West and, at the same time, call on the latter, and its leading country, to establish a planetary empire, trampling over the principle of equality between nations which underlay the anti colonial revolutions. Yet Ferguson is in no doubt. Ambitious Third World freedom fighters liked the opportunities the distinctly unfree Soviet system had to offer them. In a one-party system, the first winner takes all, there is no danger of his being asked to hand over power to some rival within just a few years. And with a planned economy, the new political rulers can acquire any economic assets they like in the name of nationalization. 132. The legitimation of anti-colonial revolutions thus ends up in personal abuse of their leaders, who are not conceded any genuine motives, but appear motivated exclusively by libido dominandi and material greed.
it remains to be explained why they faced the severe sacrifices and dangers of a protracted revolutionary struggle, and how they succeeded in winning a mass following, composed of militants themselves imbued with a spirit of sacrifice, and, further, in resisting attempts at destabilization and invasion, often undertaken by the USA and the West. On the other hand, of course, this insulting, ad personum hermeneutic of suspicion could easily be applied to the American Revolution taken as a model by Ferguson. Its authors, as he acknowledges, were able to expand their landed property at the expense of the natives, and to increase and consolidate their property in human livestock at the expense of the blacks. Ferguson's line of argument is all the more trifling for liquidating the anti-colonial revolution in the whole arc of its historical unfolding, well prior to the advent of communism. He ignores Toussaint L. Ovitcha, who could not identify with the North American Republic because it identified with the slave owners whom the black Jacobin was fighting. He condemns Simon Bolivar as inherently dictatorial. He does not even spare an anti-colonial revolution that began in Europe one year before the October Revolution, involving a country that came to be celebrated as an economic tiger, at least until the onset of the global economic crisis in 2008. In 1916, while the First World War was raging, a rebellion broke out in Ireland. The rebels sought to take advantage of the situation to win independence, rather than to fight and die in the service of an age-old oppressor who had not hesitated to employ genocidal practices on occasion. Here is how the events are narrated by Ferguson. The insurgents were a thousand or so extreme Irish nationalists, theirs was plainly an act of treason. Repression followed, the dying Connolly had to be propped up in a chair to be shot. After the war, the independence movement, which had become powerful, was confronted without pity. The colonial power did not hesitate to open fire on an unarmed mass of civilians. Such evidence of firmness does not seem sufficient to Ferguson. But as would happen so often in the period, the British lacked the stomach for repression. By 1921, with British losses approaching 1,400, the will to fight had gone and a peace deal was hastily cobbled together. Time and again, in the interwar period, this was a pattern that would repeat itself. A minor outbreak of dissent, a sharp military response, followed by a collapse of British self-confidence, hand-wringing, second thoughts, a messy concession, another concession. But Ireland was the test case. In allowing their very first colony to be split in two, the British had sent a signal to the Empire at large point 133. The rebellion of colonial peoples extended far beyond the island, Indians looked to Ireland and drew the obvious conclusion. It was no good just waiting to be given Home Rule 134 from the periphery of the empire, the crisis reached its centre, by the 1930s many people in Britain had got the habit of rubbishing the empire 135 it was the beginning of the end for the British Empire. But is that proof of the failure of the Irish Revolution or of its success? the USA, China, and Ferguson sequence. Just as the denigration of the rest by contrast with the West is conducted with particular reference to Chinese civilization, so the delegitimation of the anti-colonial revolutions focuses on the chapter of history concluding with the foundation of the People's Republic of China and on the leaders and first decade of the new state, which was subjected to terrible diplomatic isolation and forced to struggle for its survival. We are familiar with Ferguson's forceful description of the horror of the Japanese invasion, utter dehumanization of the people to be subjugated, explicitly reduced to pigs who could be sacrificed at will and for sheer pleasure, competitions to see who was quickest at killing them, and mass rape of women often followed by savage sadism and murder. Consequently, it would seem logical to acknowledge those who dared to rebel against all this, in what was a seemingly desperate situation because of the asymmetry of forces. But who were they? The Japanese invasion did not elicit national unity, as some Chinese nationalists had hoped it might. It boosted support for the Communist Party, which under Mao Zedong's leadership now committed itself to a campaign of protracted guerrilla warfare. At the same time, Japanese incursion tended to widen divisions within the Kuomintang. The more recruits the communists were able to find among impoverished and disillusioned peasants,
the more tempted some nationalists were to compromise with the Japanese. 136. Hence, along with the names of Toussaint Elovicha and those who fostered uprisings against the Nazi troops engaged in the enslavement and decimation of the peoples of Central Eastern Europe and the Judeocid, the name of Mao Zedong, at least as regards the years of anti-Japanese resistance, should occupy a place of honor not only in the history books, but also in texts of civic education. However, this is not the position of Ferguson, who in fact stages a bizarre comparison. Despite the painful interruption of the Great Depression, the United States suffered nothing so devastating as China's wretched 20th century ordeal of revolution, civil war, Japanese invasion, more revolution, man-made famine, and yet more, cultural, revolution. In 1968 the average American was 33 times richer than the average Chinese. 137. Here we have an outright condemnation of the Chinese anti-colonial revolution, pronounced on the basis of a comparison between two countries whose prior history and material conditions could not be more different. From its foundation, sheltered from the danger of invasion, the USA enjoyed an uninterrupted process of expansion, first continental, and then overseas. By contrast, from the Opium Wars onwards China endured successive invasions and financial bloodlettings, in a process that culminated in the Japanese invasion, whose watchword says it all, take all, kill all, burn all, point 138 it would unquestionably have been more logical to compare China before and after the Opium Wars, or before and after the victory of the anti-colonial revolution, or countries like India and China in the years following the end of their colonial or semi-colonial status. But if one wants to stick with a comparison between China and the USA, then we can offer a different one from Ferguson's, which is certainly no less polemical but is rather less dubious. In the years immediately following the revolution led by the Founding Fathers, we witness in the USA a deterioration in the condition of black slaves and an intensification in the process of the expropriation, deportation, and decimation of the natives. By contrast, the victory of the revolution led by Mao Zedong put an end to the Japanese Empire's plans to reduce the Chinese to Indians to be decimated or blacks to be enslaved. But we must now examine the sequence in which Ferguson encapsulates the history of 20th century China, the ordeal of revolution civil war, Japanese invasion, more revolution. An epic anti-colonial revolution, putting an end to unprecedented horrors, is alluded to almost peevishly. And the Japanese invasion, treated as something comparable to the Great Depression, figures as one of many misfortunes, and not the most serious, marking the 20th century history of China, which emerges as the sole real culprit for the enormous tragedies it endured. One thing is clear. When he contrasts the British Empire positively with its Japanese counterpart, Ferguson provides an apt description of the latter's infamy. But when it comes to contrasting the misery of the Chinese anti-colonial revolution with the splendor of the American Empire, that infamy becomes an anodyne Japanese invasion. Still dealing with Ferguson's sequence, more revolution follows immediately upon man-made famine. A whole chapter of history is thereby repressed. Even before the foundation of the People's Republic, the revolution led by the party that had distinguished itself in the struggle against Japanese imperialism became an American target. Politically, diplomatically, and militarily, the U.S. backed the party which, in order to defend the privileges of the small ruling elite, had sought a compromise with the barbaric invaders. Washington responded to the communists' arrival in power with economic warfare and a naval blockade, while Kuomintang air raids on the industrial cities of mainland China, including Shanghai, continued with U.S. assistance. 139 Hence the sequence set out by Ferguson, Japanese invasion, more revolution, man-made famine, needs to be altered or at least completed, Japanese invasion, more revolution, new aggression, this time perpetrated not by the empire of the rising sun, but by the American Empire. The latter refused to recognize the People's Republic diplomatically and in fact did everything it could to isolate and strangle it, while domestically it engaged in a revealing debate, who lost China. Even after Deng Xiaoping's reforms, Washington could not resign itself to the loss of a massive potential market and reserve of cheap labor, 
as well as a crucial region for the conquest of global hegemony. Some analysts even predicted that the special economic zones would become like American colonies in East Asia. Americans had thought China would become a giant economic subsidiary of the United States, in an approximate reenactment of the open door era of the early 20th century. Instead, they now found themselves facing a new economic rival. 140. But let us pursue our analysis of Ferguson's sequence Japanese invasion, more revolution, man made famine. We may start by posing a question was famine, which follows revolution, its consequence, or a much earlier phenomenon, which the revolution sought to combat? Let us cite some data the great droughts in North China of 1876 to 79 caused the death of 9 to 13 million people. 141 this was a tragedy that tended to recur periodically. In 1928 the death toll amounted to nearly 3 million deaths in the province of Shenzhen alone. 142 there was no escaping hunger or cold. People burnt the lintels of houses to warm themselves. 143 famine in spring remained a perennial threat across much of China. Death from starvation was such a common occurrence that the ruling classes had no problem sacrificing people en masse in a different way in war, when in 1938 at the Kuomintang blew the dikes of the Yellow River to block the Japanese advance, the flooding killed almost one million peasants. It repeated the dike blowing tactics in 1945 when attacking communist bases 144 in any event, contrary to Ferguson's insinuation, in China famine was not a consequence of the revolution. If we examine the years 1850 to 1950, from the first opium war and the eruption of colonialism to the victory of the anti-colonial, and socialist, revolution, and bear in mind the catastrophes punctuating this major historical crisis, military invasions, insurrections, natural cataclysms, a conclusion dictates itself, almost certainly the number of victims involved had never been so high in the history of the world 145. Having analyzed the substantive in the phrase man-made famine, let us now turn to the adjective or the participle employed in an adjectival form, man-made. It is worth noting that, when it comes to the famine which struck Ireland in the mid-19th century, Ferguson prefers to speak of the calamity of Irish famine. 146 Yet the latter was greeted by a prominent representative of the British government as a gift from heaven, as something intended by an omniscient providence. Chapter 5, 10. Nothing of the sort occurred in China's great leap forward in the late 1950s. Why only refer to man made famine in this instance? We may set Ireland to one side. Positioned immediately after more revolution, the phrase man-made famine refers exclusively to the responsibility of China's leaders. But is this a balanced judgment? We have seen that, emerging devastated from the Japanese occupation and a civil war that was not quite over, China under communist rule became the target of American military threats and economic warfare. The Truman administration pursued an objective clarified by a U.S. author who sympathetically describes the prominent role played in the Cold War by Washington's policy of encirclement and economic strangulation of the People's Republic. The latter must be plagued by a general standard of living around and below subsistence level, a country in desperate need must be induced into a catastrophic economic situation, towards disaster and collapse. 147 In the early 1960s, a collaborator in the Kennedy administration, W. W. Rostow, boasted of the victory secured by the USA, which had succeeded in retarding China's economic development by at least tens of years. 148. Responsibility for the man made famine is not to be sought in one direction. The causes of the catastrophe were twofold on the one hand, the policy lucidly and ruthlessly planned in Washington as early as the autumn of 1949 and on the other, the inexperience and impatience of Mao, who wished to skip the stages of development in order to escape the dangerous situation in which his country found itself. Responsibility was not equally shared between the two parties, especially given that when U.S. leaders imposed their embargo, they were aware that communist inexperience with urban economics would render it even more devastating. 149 Having moved beyond this phase, following a painful, utterly tragic learning process, 
the great Asian country succeeded in putting the phenomenon of recurrent mass famine, which was generated by colonialist and imperialist aggression in the first instance. Definitively behind it? Western fundamentalism and the ideology of war. With a long history behind them, celebration of the West as the privileged or exclusive site of civilization, and claims for white or Western supremacy on a global scale culminated in Nazi ideology. The collapse of the Third Reich and the worldwide flaring of anti-colonial revolution led to serious impairment, but not the disappearance, of the ethnological racial paradigm for interpreting historical processes and of the exalted, exclusivist sense of the West as an island of civilization surrounded by an ocean of barbarism. In 1953, Churchill called upon the West to support the presence of Britain in the Suez Canal in order to prevent a massacre of white people. 153 years later, despite the disagreement that had arisen between Washington and London in the meantime, Eisenhower cautioned that, with the nationalization of the Suez Canal, Nasser was intent on slapping the white man down. 151 clearly, as far as the two statesmen were concerned, the Arabs belonged to the populations of color and for that reason, regardless of their political conduct, were alien to civilization, and the West. On other occasions, we have seen Churchill stressing the vanguard role that the white English-speaking peoples, or the English-speaking world, were called upon to play in confronting the peril represented by communism and rebellious colonial peoples. Here the reference to skin color tends to be attenuated or to disappear, the stress is placed on language. Yet we must remember that the British statesmen proceeded no differently from supporters of the Aryan mythology. What was inferred from the linguistic community was the unity of the race underlying it, and the cultural products of the Aryan languages or the English language were adduced as evidence of the excellence of that race. Even in our day, a prominent British intellectual, Robert Conquest, has identified the true West as the English-speaking community, to be distinguished not only from barbarians utterly foreign to the West, but also from continental Europe, which has invariably been a source of bureaucracy and bureau lottery, of rejection of the Anglo-American concept of law and liberty, of anti-Americanism, and made it clear that the excellence of the English-speaking countries possesses a specifically Anglo-Celtic ethnic basis. 152 The Anglo-Celtic mythology outlined here recalls the Aryan mythology of ill repute. There is only one clarification to be made. Cherished by a long tradition that developed on both sides of the Atlantic and then issued into Nazism, Aryan mythology tended to be identified with the white mythology. At all events, it paid tribute to the Nordic peoples and all the peoples that had started out from German soil, hence including the British and Americans. By contrast, the Anglo-Celtic community celebrates its superiority even over continental Europe. The club of genuinely civilized peoples dear to conquest is even more exclusive than that celebrated by Aryan mythology. The racial or ethnological racial paradigm can assume a more or less attenuated form. The most famous theoretician of the clash of civilizations today poses a question, why, in addition to Europe, the USA, and Canada, do Australia and New Zealand form part of Western civilization, whereas Mexico and Brazil? which are located not in Asia but in the Western Hemisphere, are excluded from it. How are we to explain such inclusions and exclusions? Samuel P. Huntington responds with great clarity, Latin American civilization incorporates indigenous cultures, which did not exist in Europe and were effectively wiped out in North America and in Australia and New Zealand. To be precise, what, in addition to cultures, were swept away were the peoples embodying them. The famous political scientist does not conceal the fact. The Puritan colonists who landed in North America worked on the assumption that expulsion and slash or extermination of the Indians were the only policies to follow in the future. 153. Surprisingly, there is an undeniable similarity with Hitler's way of arguing, when he explained the infinite superiority of the USA, in his view an integral part of the West and the Germanic world, over Latin America, completely alien to the West. Let us read Mein Kampf. Historical experience offers countless proofs of this. It shows with terrifying clarity that in every mingling of Aryan blood with that of lower peoples the result was the end of the cultured people.
North America, whose population consists in by far the largest part of Germanic elements who mixed but little with the lower colored peoples, shows a different humanity and culture from Central and South America, where the predominantly Latin immigrants often mixed with the Aborigines on a large scale. By this one example, we can clearly and distinctly recognize the effect of racial mixture. 154. Naturally, there is no question of equating positions that should not be confounded. But we do want to signal the danger of sliding into the ethnological racial paradigm starting from a paradigm, the clash of civilizations, that intends to be, and is, different. Civilizations have a real existence, which does not refer to skin color or race. If, however, rather than being understood on the basis of determinate historical conflicts, they are regarded as the expression of a quasi-eternal spirit or soul, then civilization, like race, tends to refer to a mythical nature. It is no accident that celebration of the Western soul, Abendlandisk seal, plays an essential role in Oswald Spengler 155 and in the reactionary German culture that flowed into Nazism. And it is no accident if, in the view of Alfred Rosenberg, the Third Reich's main theoretician, the soul is race seen from within, just as race is the external side of a soul. 156 We can understand Toynbee's warning in the 1950s against persistent Western race feeling. 157 An essentialist vision of civilization and Western fundamentalism are even more marked in Ferguson. In his work, the eternal moral and political primacy of the West becomes a dogma. True, he criticizes as nonsense the thesis dear to American white supremacists, subsequently adopted by the Nazis, that segregation was the key reason why the United States had prospered, while the mongrel peoples of Latin America were mired in poverty. 158 However, completely ignoring history and geopolitics, he considers but one side of the coin of American liberty and arrives at this conclusion, the difference in economic and political development between the North and South of the American continent can be explained by the fact that the revolution led by Washington was the most successful revolution ever made in the name of liberty, while Bolivar's dream turned out be not democracy but dictatorship. 159 We are once again referred to nature, albeit that the indicated nature is not race this time, but the sick psychology of the Latin American leader, and his followers. We should not forget that the ethnological racial paradigm readily intermingled with the psychopathological paradigm in Nazism. The nature of an order based on healthy racial hierarchy was to be defended against the assault of barbarians or inferior races, ethnological racial paradigm, on the one hand, and against mass subversion inside the citadel of civilization by those fostering insane ideas of equality and leveling, psychopathological paradigm, on the other. Not by chance, Hitler boasted of having detected the Judeo-Bolshevik virus as the source of the revolt of inferior races. Ferguson is aware of the fact that anti-Semitism and rabid hatred of the Jewish race in interwar Poland and, above all, in Nazi, or incipiently Nazi, Germany was imbued with the conviction that salvation lay in eradicating a virus or bacillus lethal to society, as one Polish politician put it, the Jewish community was a foreign body, dispersed in our organism so that it produces a pathological deformation. And a sort of Polish poem expressed itself in similar terms in 1922, Jewry is contaminating Poland thoroughly. It poisons the spirit. A terrible gangrene has infiltrated our body 160 yet not many pages prior to this the British historian writes. Two epidemics swept the world in 1918. One was Spanish influenza. As if to mock the efforts of men to kill one another, the virus spread rapidly across the United States and then crossed to Europe on the crowded American troop ships. The other epidemic was Bolshevism, which for a time seemed almost as contagious and ultimately proved as lethal as the influenza. 161. The Judeo Bolshevik virus that fueled the anti Semitic and anti communist campaign in the interwar years, and which was Hitler's particular obsession is now configured as the Bolshevik influenza. Once again, there is no question of equating very different political and ideological positions. Instead, 
it is a matter of cautioning against the naturalistic connotations peculiar to the psychopathological paradigm and the latter's tendency to cross over into the ethnologico-racial paradigm. Tocqueville identified the French and, in particular, the Jacobins as the carriers of a virus of a new and unknown kind, which allegedly underlay the incessant French revolutionary cycle. Having condemned ressentiment as the motive behind rebellion against the power exercised by the masters and the successful, Nietzsche pointed to the Jews as the people of ressentiment par excellence. Finally, Hitler prided himself on having finally discovered the source of the disease and the revolutionary infection. It was Jews and Bolsheviks, who were regularly equated, in part on account of the Jewish origin of a significant number of leaders of the Russian revolutionary movement, Chapter 5, 8. The process of ethnicization of the revolutionary virus can assume very different forms. But what remains constant is the danger of slippage from the psychopathological paradigm, which refers to mental illness, to the naturalistic paradigm, which refers to the inferior or degenerate ethnicity and race. Ferguson's positions are disturbing for another reason. Visiting the United States in the late 19th century, when the racial state was more robust than ever and the regime of white supremacy rampant in the South, Friedrich Ratzel, the first theoretician of the Lebensraum cherished by Nazism, drew attention to the complete failure of the project of constructing a society based on the principle of racial equality. Where was the emancipation of the blacks? Subject to lynching and interminable torture staged as a mass spectacle for applauding crowds, the fate of ex-slaves was perhaps even worse than in the past. On closer inspection, the situation created in the North American Republic avoids the form of slavery, but retains the essence of subordination, of social hierarchy on a racial basis, it continued to recognize the principle of racial aristocracy. The conclusion was obvious, experience teaches us to recognize racial differences, they had proved much more enduring than the abolition of slavery, which will one day seem a mere episode and abortive endeavor. A reversal had occurred vis-a-vis -vis the fond illusions of abolitionists and fanatics for the idea of equality. The impact of all this would be felt far beyond the United States, we are only just beginning to see the results this reversal will produce in Europe even more than in Asia 162 this was a prediction, and wish, of deadly lucidity. The racial state became a trend with the Third Reich, but also, to different degrees and in different ways, with the empire of the rising sun and Mussolini's empire. Today, it is not difficult to point to the tragic condition of a considerable number of newly independent countries and peoples. But what does this prove? Simply that the process of emancipation, in the case of slaves as in that of colonial peoples in general, is long and tortuous. After the American Civil War, no longer slaves and chattels subject to sale and purchase like any other commodity, African Americans did not thereby become free. As regards colonial peoples, the conquest of political independence does not betoken liberation from the domination exercised by informal empire. 163 or, in Lenin's words, to put an end to economic annexation, it is not enough to shake off political annexation. 164 but neither the former slaves, nor the former colonies, aspire to return to the status quo ante or feel nostalgia for slavery or colonial subjugation. Ferguson tirelessly proclaims the failure, if not of the abolitionist revolution, then of the anti-colonialist revolution. Furthermore, he regards the principle of the equality of nations, if not that of racial equality, as utterly refuted by historical experience. For this reason he repeatedly stresses the need for a theoretical and political turn, I am fundamentally in favor of empire. Indeed, I believe that empire is more necessary in the 21st century than ever before 165 thus, successive neocolonial wars are legitimized and hallowed. Where will it all end? To achieve a new order based on explicit denial of the principle of the equality of nations, the British historian believes one must be prepared to pay an extremely high price. How many deaths did the war in Vietnam cause? In 2004, a conservative French newspaper calculated that, 30 years after the end of hostilities, there were still 4 million victims whose bodies were suffering the ravages of the terrible Agent Orange, 
named after the color of the dioxin unsparingly sprayed by U.S. planes on a whole people, point 166 the same year, Ferguson criticized the USA for having capitulated, on balance, Americans preferred the irresponsibilities of weakness 167. What provides particular food for thought is Ferguson's assessment of the Korean War. In 1951, Truman rejected MacArthur's proposal to drop 50 atomic bombs on Chinese cities. However, stresses Ferguson, in January of the following year it was the president himself who entertained a similar plan. The USSR and China were to be sent an ultimatum and, in the absence of a positive response within 10 days, all-out war would have to be launched, it means that Moscow, St. Petersburg, Mukden, Vladivostok, Peking, Shanghai, Port Arthur, Darren, Odessa, Stalingrad, and every manufacturing plant in China and the Soviet Union will be eliminated 168 as we know, things turned out differently, and Ferguson does not seem altogether content with it. By overruling MacArthur, Truman, and the chiefs of staff had unwittingly prolonged the war for more than two years. By the time the armistice was signed, on July 27, 1953, more than 30,000 American servicemen had lost their lives. The United States in 1951 had both the military capability and the public support to strike a decisive military blow against Maoist China. Many another imperial power would have been unable to resist the window of opportunity afforded by America's huge lead in the atomic arms race. 169. In his time, Gandhi referred to Hitlerism, or conversion to Hitler's method, a propos of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 170. But the plans pressed by MacArthur and entertained by Truman, from which the revisionist historian is careful not to distance himself went far beyond the two atomic bombs that sealed the end of the Second World War and possibly the start of the Cold War. Let us be quite clear, it is not a question of conjuring up the specter of the Fourth Reich, the historical process is quite distinct from any eternal return of the same. But the extraordinary success enjoyed by Ferguson and his imperial mythology confirms the West's inability to engage in a genuine coming to terms with the past, how far by Tung der Vergangenheit, and does not augur well for the future. Underscore 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 underscore. Chapter 7. The Black Book, The Communist. Movement and the Struggle Against the Three Major Forms of Discrimination. The Statistics of Horror. What is immediately striking in the Black Book of Communism 1 and the massive literature that takes the same line, is the statistics. Listed, added up, repeated in an obsessive crescendo, they seem intent on stunning readers, inducing them to regard any further argument as superfluous and forcing them to acknowledge a truth with the self-evidence of a mountain of corpses. In readers who are less naive, whether on account of historical memory or familiarity with historical literature, this is followed by a different, unanticipated reaction, how the climate has changed compared with the immediate post-war period. These were years when any calculus of horrors targeted colonialism, along with the artisans of the final solution. Hannah Arendt reproved colonialism for having resorted to the extermination of the natives, which was virtually on the agenda when new colonial settlements were being constructed in America, Australia, and Africa. Point two Norberto Babayo highlighted the practice of extermination, as well as economic exploitation and enslavement, inherent in four centuries of colonial expansion by the West, often the liberal West. Point three. This negative judgment was not expressed exclusively as regards the past. With the development of the colonial liberation movement, calculations increasingly involved the present. Having recorded the 45,000 dead at Setif, 1945, the 90,000 dead in Madagascar, 1947, the 200,000 victims of the repression in Kenya, 1952, Fanon gave the floor to the Algerian anti-colonial movement, which in 1957 accused the French authorities of conducting a policy verging on genocide, in fact, of seeking to realize the most frightful work of extermination of modern times. The memory of the crimes of Nazism and fascism was still fresh, and what had they been if not colonialism when rooted in a traditionally colonialist country?
such were the sentiments of militants of the Algerian independence movement, cited by Fanon, who reiterated the point, not long ago Nazism transformed the whole of Europe into a veritable colony for. Arendt's opinion was not dissimilar. During the war, she defined Nazism as the most horrible imperialism the world has ever seen. Five. It was from the tradition behind it that the Third Reich, a kind of highest stage of imperialism, had inherited belief in the natural law of the rights of the strongest and the tendency to exterminate inferior races unworthy of survival. Point six. The major historian Arnold Toynbee ultimately moved in the same direction, drawing attention to the fact that fascism and Nazism involved countries which were members of the family of the West from birth. Point seven. The dark pages in its history had to be examined if one wanted to understand the infamy that had culminated in Auschwitz. Now, by contrast, everything has changed, the horror of Hitler's regime is but an adversarial replica of the horror of communism, which is the veritable original sin of the 20th century. In addition to the dictates of historical rigor, this new assessment claims to be dictated by the agonizing moral exigency of rescuing from oblivion the innumerable, long-forgotten victims of the sanguinary experience that began with the Bolshevik Revolution. However, the Nazism-Communism equation leads to the disappearance of colonialism, which for very different authors was previously the privileged reference point for understanding the Third Reich. Perhaps, contrary to appearances, one calculus of horrors replacing another without further ado is not so immediately self-evident, perhaps it does not render arguments or questions superfluous. Can we find an explicit theorization of genocide in the annals of history? In 1883, the year Marx died, Gumplau's counter posed the reality of the race struggle to Marx's thesis of the class struggle, which was adjudged ideological. So implacable was this reality that it sometimes permitted of no escape. In specific conditions, it became naturally necessary for members of a different ethnic group to be dehumanized and destroyed. This had happened to the natives of America, the Hottentots of South Africa, and the natives of Australia, swept away by a war of annihilation. Point eight across the Atlantic, Theodore Roosevelt remarked that the hard, energetic practical men charged with terminating barbarism and extending civilization must not allow themselves to be prone to false sentimentality. Point nine for his part, the American statesman was utterly immune to any such attitude. On the contrary, he seemed almost amused by the spectacle of the Redskins being wiped off the face of the earth, were there really any good Indians apart from dead ones, or slaughtered ones? Chapter 5, 5 In fact, genocide was not only theorized. Between 1904 and 1907, the Herero rebelled in Africa against Imperial Germany. The repression was pitiless, any Herero found within German borders of the colonies subjugated by the Second Reich, with or without a carbine, with or without livestock, will be shot. I shall no longer accept women or children, I shall send them back to their people, or give orders to open fire on them. Such is my decision about the Herero people. The motivation for this decision is significant. General von Trotha explained that the nation as such must be destroyed, because it could no longer be utilized even as raw material. Point 10. It would be foolish and misleading to seek to impute all this to an imaginary eternal Germany. The logic followed by the German general had been clarified some years earlier by Hobson, the anti-imperialist liberal appreciated by Lenin. Hobson observed that colonialism entailed forced labor for the natives and the decimation and destruction of peoples who could not be subjected to, or could not survive, it, as had occurred in the case of Australian Bushmen, African Bushmen, and Hottentots, Red Indians, and Maoris. All these peoples had become a dead weight for the superior white settlers. Point 11. We need only add that a deadly struggle began to develop among the latter. The Boers, demanding the right to use the natives of southern Africa as work tools, and laying claim to the land and resources extorted from them, came into conflict with Imperial Britain and in their turn were overpowered. They were imprisoned and block, regardless of age or sex in what began to be called camps or concentration camps. One author reports that such a system had been employed by Spain, in an attempt to deal with the Cuban people's independence struggle. Point 12, in fact, 
the USA had already used camps to repress the independence struggle of the Filipino people. But it was the fate of the Boers, a colonizing people of European origin, that prompted indignation in much of Western public opinion, which denounced the horror of the universe concentration air, the annihilation of the Boer race and, above all, the unending death toll of children and their Holocaust. Point 13. By contrast, massacres of colonial populations elicited no particular response. In fact, in this instance, putting even women and children to death was explicitly provided for and recommended. A warning from Theodore Roosevelt, which the Herero, unfortunately, were unable to read, dates from the late 19th century, if any black or yellow people should really menace the whites, or merely jeopardize white control, the superior race would be bound to wage a general war of extermination and the clamor of protests would soon be hushed, and rightly so. Point 14. All the great colonial powers of the time resorted to such practices. In the case of the USA, the campaign against the Native Americans afforded a model. And it was explicitly invoked and flaunted, as well as ruthlessly applied, when it came to restoring order, and colonial rule, in the Philippines. The Laboratory of the Third Reich This was a model constantly borne in mind by Hitler, who sought his far west in the east and identified the natives of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union as Indians to be stripped of their land, decimated and, in the name of the march of civilization, pushed ever farther back beyond the Urals. The survivors were permitted to work like black slaves in the service of the white, Aryan race. Mussolini likewise admired the harsh and fascinating great conquest of the Far West, which could serve as a model for colonial expansion 15 except that, rather than to Eastern Europe, Italian fascism initially looked to Ethiopia for territory to colonize and natives to decimate or enslave. Leafing through the speeches in which the Duce sought to justify and transfigure his aggression, it is as if we are rereading texts from earlier decades. At the Berlin Conference in 1884-5, on the eve of the annexation of the Congo, Leopold II of Belgium had declared, to open to civilization the only part of our globe which it has not yet penetrated, to pierce the darkness which hangs over entire peoples, is, I dare say, a crusade worthy of the century of progress 16 here is Mussolini on December 30, 1934, this problem has existed since 1885. Ethiopia is the last corner of Africa that does not have European masters. And in two subsequent speeches, of October 18, 1935 and May 6, 1936, Mussolini referred to terminating age-old slavery and a barbaric, slave-driving pseudo-state, ruled by the Negus of the slave drivers. Point 17 as in the Congo, so in Ethiopia, the civilizing crusade actually proved to be a war of extermination. Fascist troops employed mustard gas and poison gas on a massive scale, engaged in large-scale massacres of the civilian population, used concentration camps, and resorted to the destruction of intellectuals and all those who could help preserve a people's sense of identity. Abolitionist rhetoric was belied by the reality of large-scale enslavement of the natives. For Italian fascism, the latter not only represented a reserve of servile manpower, but a reserve reproducing itself through hereditary transmission. Consequently, mixed sexual relations and marriages seemed insane and criminal. Quite apart from the abnormality of the physiological deed, declared the Minister for Italian Africa, Alessandro Lessena, coupling with inferior creatures would end up causing social promiscuity, in which our best qualities as ruling stock would be obliterated. Point 18 In turn, in a circular dated September 1938, the Minister of State Education, Dino Alfieri, drew attention to the need for defense of the race in the territories of the empire, preventing any miscegenation with the natives and hence the dreadful scourge of mongrelism. Point 19 For the empire to be retained, urged the Duce personally, the natives must have a very clear, overwhelming conception of our superiority. Bidding a final farewell to vacuous words like human race 20 racial hierarchy must be visible and incontestable to all, the ban on miscegenation and racial bastardization must be respected and segregation imposed.
This takes us back to the decades between the 19th and 20th centuries in the United States and South Africa. The brutality theorized, and practiced, against colonial populations also left its mark in the capitalist metropolises. Segregated, subjected to semi-servile labor relations, and often victims of lynching and violence by assault squads, blacks were assimilated to beasts in the south of the USA. As we know, their acts of rebellion against white supremacy even led to temptations of a war of extermination, to adopt Theodore Roosevelt's terminology. It was here that a watchword emerged which was to enjoy tragic success in the 20th century. An ultimate solution of the American Negro question was required, in the context of a final and complete solution of the problem posed by peoples who resisted being subjugated and enslaved by white, Western colonizers. Point 21. The fate meted out to Native Americans and blacks over centuries furnished fascism and Nazism with a self-proclaimed model. The colonial tradition seems to have exercised a certain influence even on the fate of the Jews. They were doubly guilty in Hitler's view. They pursued a policy of miscegenation and bastardization of races different from the Semitic one and thus, along with the Bolsheviks, could all the more easily incite the revolt of inferior races. In order for there to be no escape from the regime of racial segregation, Mussolini stated, echoing Hitler, that the dignity and purity of the dominant race must be asserted not only against Hamites, or Africans, but also against Semites, that is, Jews. There was no room for any form of pietism, the racial laws of the empire will be strictly obeyed and all those who sin against them will be expelled, punished, imprisoned. Point 22 After the enactment of the anti-Semitic legislation, the parabola of the racist delirium culminated in the Republic of Salo. An appeal to youth to enroll so that the blacks in the service of England do not contaminate the sacred soil of the fatherland 23 went together with delivering Jews to the Nazis and collaborating with the Third Reich in the final solution. Initially, at any rate, the Nazi ring leaders proposed to establish a Juden reservat, a reservation for Jews 24 similar to that to which the Native Americans were confined. We have seen Alfred Rosenberg express his pleasure at the deportation not only of the blacks, but also of the yellow men, Chapter 1, 5. In the USA, the Exclusion Act directed against the Chinese, who were the target of legal forms of discrimination and sometimes the victims of pogroms, was still in full force. From the late 19th century, in different ways and to varying degrees of intensity, the myth of race tended to impact on all those who were alien to the pure stock of the whites. This was a general phenomenon, but it assumed particular prominence in a country where the social and racial questions were interlinked, on account not only of the presence of blacks and Native Americans, but also of successive waves of immigration, if not from the colonial or semi-colonial world, then from zones regarded as alien to civilization or on its margins. These immigrants came to occupy the bottom rungs of the labor market. Often, they were frozen out of it and oscillated between unemployment and criminality. They were life's failures, who tended to reproduce themselves from one generation to the next and therefore constituted a race harmful to society. Deriving from Britain, where it was first theorized by Darwin's cousin Galton, a new science, eugenics, arrived in the USA and enjoyed extraordinary success. From the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, a movement developed that was intent on preventing procreation by elements prone to crime or parasitism. Between 1907 and 1915, 13 U.S. states enacted laws for compulsory sterilization, covering, according to Indiana's legislation, the first state to move in this direction, habitual delinquents, idiots, imbeciles, and rapists. There were those who proposed extending such legislation to vagabonds, for the most part members of an inferior race. Point 25. With the emergence of the anti colonial revolution in the wake of the October Revolution, new anxieties arose or old ones increased. What was happening in the colonies and why were the savages rebelling? Who was inciting them, challenging the healthy, natural racial hierarchy? One thing was certain a new, deadly danger must be recognized and the menace of the under man confronted. 
such was the subtitle of a book published in New York in 1922, whose author was Lothrop Stoddard. He spelled out the significance of the term coined by him. It referred to all those melancholy waste products which each living species excretes, the mass of inferior elements, the unadaptable and the incapable, savages and barbarians, who were often full of resentment and hatred for superior personalities, who had now proved themselves unconvertible and ready to declare war on civilization. Such was the terrible threat, at once social and ethnic, which absolutely must be averted if our civilization is to be saved from decline and our race from decay. The book we are referring to was rapidly translated into German, Undermann became Untermensch, in the singular, and Untermenschen, in the plural. Point 26 This was a keyword of Nazi ideology and Rosenberg acknowledged the U.S. author for having coined it. Point 27 Let us take stock. The terminology that began to emerge and become established between the late 19th and early 20th centuries is symptomatic. The main categories and keywords of Nazi ideology, those giving radical expression to its destructive charge against the universal concept of man and its genocidal drive, or which in any event afford a glimpse of the horror of the Third Reich, all go back, directly or indirectly, to the colonial tradition. Konzentrationlager is a calc of concentration camps, Untermensch is the literal translation of Underman, the endlosing of the Jewish question recalls the ultimate solution of the black question, or the final and complete solution of the problem of colonial peoples, the Blutschanda, against which Nazism endlessly warned, brings to mind miscegenation, a cause for horror in the USA of the white supremacy, behind race and hygiene is clearly eugenics. As regards war of extermination, destruction of the race and holocaust, comment is superfluous. If the terms in italics presided over Hitler's attempt to build a racial state in Germany and the German Empire, those in quotation marks date back to the British Empire and, above all, the American one, or the regime of white supremacy that raged against Native Americans and blacks in particular, but which did not spare immigrants variously suspected of being alien to the pure white race. Point 28. There is no doubt that the laboratory of the Third Reich and of the horrors of the 20th century was in full swing, and it went back to the colonial tradition, or the history of the treatment inflicted on the barbarians in the colonies and the metropolises themselves by those who proclaimed themselves the exclusive representatives of civilization. Accordingly, when historical revisionism and the Black Book of Communism date the start of the history of genocide and horror from communism, they engage in a colossal repression. Solemnly proclaimed, the moral commitment to give voice to unjustly forgotten victims turns into its opposite, a deadly silence that buries the Native Americans, the Herero, the colonial populations, the barbarians for a second time. This is a silence fraught with consequences on a specifically historiographical level as well, because it makes it impossible to understand Nazism and fascism. Does the bombardment of statistics on the crimes of communism at least help us to grasp the significance of the experience that began with October 1917? The history of the West as the history of a master race democracy. Let us take a glance at the world so positively transfigured by the yearnings and mystifications of the dominant ideology, the world devastated by the Bolshevik Revolution. In the early 20th century, no clouds appeared on the horizon to disturb the enchanted climate of the Belle Epoque. In 1910, a funeral, that of Edward VII, King of England, was the occasion for a splendid procession, which saw kings, hereditary princes, and dukes, united by ties of kinship and common mourning, parade on horseback. Time seemed not to have made the least dent in the power and prestige of the European aristocracy. Nine monarchs, all descendants of William the Silent, occupied the stage, the representatives of France and the USA took more of a back seat. The West presented itself as homogeneous in another respect as well. Although conflicts were becoming visible, the great powers felt themselves infinitely superior to the inferior races and gloried in belonging to a family, in fact, an extremely exclusive race. Defined and celebrated by a wide variety of names, European, White, Nordic, Western, Aryan, etc., it stood for civilization as such, a small, 
happy island in a boundless ocean of barbarism. At the time, Tsarist Russia, whose civilizing role in Asia was acknowledged by Theodore Roosevelt, also belonged to this family. Having been crowned king in London, Edward VII's successor, George V, participated in a ceremony in India the following year that elevated him to the status of emperor. Among those paying tribute to him were Indian princes and maharajas who acted as pages, sumptuously attired but submissive and docile. Point 29 corresponding to this splendid ceremony and similar ones, with which the conquerors sought to impress on the natives an image of their infinite superiority, was the reality of a rule which, as we know, did not shrink from the most terrible forms of oppression and violence. The history of the West confronts us with a paradox, which becomes intelligible if we start with the history of its leading country today. Democracy within the white community developed pari passu with the enslavement of blacks and the deportation, and decimation, of Native Americans. For 32 of the first 36 years of the USA's existence, the presidential incumbents were slave owners, as were the men who drafted the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. In the absence of slavery, and the subsequent racial segregation, we shall understand nothing of American liberty. They developed together, the one sustaining the other. While the peculiar institution ensured iron control of the dangerous classes at the point of production, the shifting frontier and progressive expansion to the West diffused social conflict, transforming a potential proletariat into a class of landowners at the expense of populations condemned to be repressed or swept away. After the baptism of the War of Independence, American democracy underwent further development in the 1830s with the Jackson presidency. The abolition, in large part, of censitary discrimination within the white community was accompanied by a strong impetus to the deportation of Indians and the rise of a climate of resentment and violence against blacks. A similar observation can be made about the so-called progressive era, from the 1890s to the 1910s. It was unquestionably characterized by numerous democratic reforms, direct election of the Senate, the secret vote, the introduction of primaries and referendums, etc. At the same time, however, it was a particularly tragic period for blacks, target of the Squad DIST terror of the Ku Klux Klan, and Native Americans, stripped of their residual land and subjected to a process of remorseless homogenization that sought to deprive them even of their cultural identity. In connection with this paradox in the history of their country, U.S. scholars have spoken of a heron folk democracy, that is, a democracy that applies exclusively to the master race, to use the language beloved of Hitler. The clear line of demarcation between whites, on the one hand, and blacks and Native Americans, on the other, was conducive to the development of relations of relative equality within the white community. The members of an aristocracy of class or color tended to celebrate themselves as peers. The manifest inequality imposed on the excluded was the converse of the relationship of parity established between those with the power to exclude inferiors. The category of heron folk democracy is also of use in explaining the history of the West in general. From the late 19th century to the early 20th, the extension of the suffrage in Europe went hand in hand with the process of colonization and the imposition of servile or semi-servile labor relations on subjugated peoples. The rule of law in the metropolis was bound up with police violence and bureaucratic arbitrariness and with states of emergency in the colonies. In the final analysis, these are the same phenomena as occurred in the history of the USA, except that in the case of Europe they proved less obvious because the colonial populations, rather than residing in the metropolis, were separated from it by an ocean. Lenin's Turn It is very difficult to find a critique of such heron folk democracy in liberal thought, which instead is often a theoretical expression of that regime. Thus, in a text devoted in its very title to liberty, we find a theorization of the absolute obedience required of races that are still in their nunnage, despotism is a legitimate form of government in dealing with barbarians. 30 The author of these sentiments in the second half of the 19th century was John Stuart Mill, who on another occasion blended considerations on the excellence of representative government, which he saw embodied primarily in the Anglo-Saxons, with depiction of 
the great majority of the human race as still in a savage or semi-savage state, and of some colonial peoples as barely above the level of higher animal species. 31. The main target of Lenin's struggle was precisely heronfold democracy based on the enslavement of hundreds of millions of working people in Asia, in the colonies in general, and in the small countries by a few chosen nations. 32. The Russian revolutionary leader meticulously highlighted the major clauses of exclusion from liberal freedom applying to colored races as well as immigrants from the more backward countries. 33 As in a game of mirrors, the West that gloried in the rule of law was faced with the truth of the colonies, the most liberal and radical personalities of Free Britain, become regular Genghis Khans when appointed to govern India. 34 Well might Geology's Italy pride itself on extending citizenship to virtually the whole male population. But once again liberal self-celebration was answered by Lenin's counter-melody. He noted how extension of the suffrage aimed to enlarge the social base of support for the expedition to Libya, that typical colonial war, waged by a civilized 20th century nation. Here we have a civilized, constitutional nation performing its work of civilization by bayonet, bullet, noose, fire, and rape, even by carnage. It is a perfected, civilized bloodbath, the massacre of Arabs with the help of the latest weapons. By way of retaliation, about 3,000 Arabs were butchered, whole families were plundered and done to death, with women and children massacred in cold blood. 35. Mill could celebrate the British Empire as a step towards universal peace and general friendly cooperation among nations. 36. However, even if we overlook the conflict between the great powers that subsequently issued in the First World War, this celebration involves a monstrous repression the great powers expeditions to the colonies are not regarded as wars. We are dealing with wars in which few Europeans died, whereas hundreds of thousands of people belonging to the nations they were subjugating died in them. And so, continues Lenin in stinging fashion, can you call them wars? Strictly speaking, they were not wars at all, and you could forget about them. The victims were not even granted the honors of war. Colonial wars were not deemed such because their victims were barbarians, who could not be regarded as nations at all, you couldn't very well call those Asians and Africans nations, 37 and who were ultimately excluded from the human community itself. These were the grounds for the rupture with social democracy. What caused it was not the reform-slash-revolution dichotomy. That is a formulaic representation, which becomes no more credible for having been so frequently shared, albeit with opposite value judgments, by both sides to the dispute. In the decades preceding the outbreak of the First World War, Bernstein saluted Imperial Germany's expansionism as a contribution to the cause of progress, civilization, and world trade, if socialists prematurely proposed to aid savages and barbarians in their struggle against impending capitalist civilization, it would be a reflux of Romanticism 38 along with the West in general, Bernstein, like Theodore Roosevelt on the other side, granted Tsarist Russia the role of guardian and dominant power in Asia. 39. The idea of mission sometimes seems to cede to that of living space. In fact, the German social democratic leader verged on social Darwinism. The representatives of the cause of progress were the strong races, which inevitably tend to grow and expand with their civilization 40 whereas a vain, retrograde resistance was mounted by peoples who were uncivilized and even incapable of civilizing themselves. When they rebelled against civilization, they must also be opposed by the working class movement. 41 While he struggled for democratic reforms in Germany, Bernstein demanded an iron fist against barbarians. Such is the logic of Herrenfolk democracy, which we have already analyzed. The subjugation of colonial peoples must not be hindered by sentimental scruples or abstract legal considerations. The strong, civilized races could not make themselves slaves of formal legality. The social democratic leader who subsequently expressed his horror at disrespect for the rules of the game in the October Revolution theorized a higher substantive legality, on the basis of the philosophy of history dear to the colonial tradition. The October Revolution effected a radical turn vis a vis an ideological and political tradition in which colonial arrogance and racial prejudice were a self-evident, undisputed fact.
In these conditions, appeals for a liberation struggle addressed to the slaves of the colonies, and to the barbarians present in the capitalist metropolis itself, was bound to seem a deadly threat to the white race, the West, and civilization as such. Bolshevism was perceived by much of the European and U.S. press as a sworn enemy not of democracy per se, but of heron folk democracy and, above all, of the global white supremacy on which the latter rested. Communists were branded and treated as renegades from the white race. An eminent member of the exclusive club of civilized peoples and the West when ruled by the Tsarist autocracy and Ancien regime, Russia became barbaric following the October Revolution and, in Spengler's words, revealed itself to be Asiatic, a member of the colonial world and populations of color, Chapter 2, 8. We can now understand what happened in the south of the USA. Even after Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president, the policy of segregation and lynching of blacks continued its ravages. Communists struggled against it and were branded as foreigners and nigger lovers by the dominant ideology. An American historian describes the courage they were forced to display, their challenge to racism and to the status quo prompted a wave of repression one might think inconceivable in a democratic country. To be a communist, and challenge white supremacy, meant facing the possibility of imprisonment, beatings, kidnapping, and even death. Point 42. That the October Revolution and the communist movement had a racial, rather than a political, origin was likewise the opinion of Henry Ford. For him, the authors of this barbaric upheaval were not the colonial peoples and Asians strictly speaking, but primarily the Jews, who were themselves to be regarded as alien to the West and civilization on account of their Oriental origins. The myth of the Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy enjoyed particular success in Germany and solemnized its bloody splendours after Hitler's arrival in power. The Jewish philologist Victor Klemperer described the insults and humiliations involved in wearing the Star of David in harrowing terms. However, a removal man who is friendly towards me following two moves, is suddenly standing in front of me in the Freiburger Strasse, takes my hand in both of his paws and whispers in a tone which must be audible on the other side of the road, well, Herr Professor, don't let it get you down. These wretched brothers of ours will soon have reached rock bottom. Klemperer comments with affectionate irony that those who thus challenged the regime at a time when the racist contagion seemed irresistible were good people with more than a whiff of the KPD German communists, 43. Branded as a direct or mediated expression of the barbarism of races that were inferior or extraneous to civilization, the communist movement performed an extraordinary pedagogical role, as well as a political one, and not only in the colonies, but also in the advanced capitalist countries. A historiography that ignores all this ends up taking the form of a tool for ideologically transfiguring heronfolk democracy. The October Revolution, the liquidation of the Ancien Regime, and the advent of the social state. But let us now turn from the colonies, and the lot of races deemed to be in their nunnage, and focus our attention on the capitalist metropolis, in fact, exclusively on its civilized population. The splendid ceremonies we have alluded to are but one index of the extraordinary vitality of the aristocracy and the Ancien Regime. Lenin highlighted the fact that, within the imperialist metropolis itself, exclusion clauses from citizenship and democracy remained in force. In Britain, the electoral law is still sufficiently restricted to exclude the lower stratum proletariat proper. Point 44 Furthermore, we might add, some privileged people continued to enjoy a plural vote, which was only finally abolished in 1948.45 the process leading to realization of the principle one person, one vote in the classical country of the liberal tradition was particularly tortuous. And it cannot be envisaged without the challenge represented by the revolution in Russia and the development of the communist movement. Even where male suffrage had become universal or well-nigh universal, it was neutralized by the existence of an upper chamber that was the preserve of the nobility and privileged classes. In the Italian Senate, the princes of the House of Savoy sat as of right. The remaining members were nominated for life by the king, on the recommendation of the president of the council. Similar considerations apply to the other European upper chambers which, with the exception of the French, were not elected, 
but characterized by an admixture of heredity and royal nomination. Even in the case of the Senate in the French Third Republic, which had behind it an uninterrupted series of revolutionary upheavals culminating in the Commune, it should be noted that it derived from an indirect election and was so composed as to guarantee marked over-representation of the countryside, and politico-social conservatism, at the expense of Paris and large towns and cities. Once again, the situation in Britain is of particular interest. In addition to the upper house, entirely hereditary, with the exception of a few bishops and judges, the landed aristocracy had control of public affairs, a situation not very different from that obtaining in Germany and Austria. In the USA, the Ancien Regime presented itself in a highly peculiar form. The residues of censitary discrimination were not of much significance. More important was the fact that the aristocracy of class was configured here as an aristocracy of race. In the south of the country, power was in the hands of those who not by chance were branded Bourbons by their opponents. The roots of a regime sometimes celebrated by its supporters, and sometimes criticized by contemporary scholars, as a caste regime, in as much as it was based on ethnic social groups rendered impervious by the ban on miscegenation, were very strong. The largest exclusion clause affected women. In Britain, the Pankhursts, mother and daughter, who led the suffragette movement, were periodically obliged to visit their country's prisons. The situation was not very different in the other major Western countries. Denounced by Lenin, and the Bolshevik Party, the exclusion of women from political rights was ended in Russia after the February Revolution, which was greeted as a proletarian revolution, because of the influence of the Soviets and popular masses, by Gramsci who warmly stressed that it has destroyed authoritarianism and replaced it by universal suffrage, extending the vote to women 2.46 The same road was then taken by the Weimar Republic, deriving from the revolution that broke out in Germany a year after the October Revolution, and only subsequently in the USA. Social and economic rights also form part of democracy as generally understood today. And it is precisely the great patriarch of neoliberalism, Hayek, who denounces the fact that their theorization and presence in the West date back to the lethal influence of the Russian Marxist Revolution, Chapter 1, 2. Naturally, the subaltern classes did not wait until 1917 before demanding recognition of such rights. Their conquest went through the same stages as the triumph of universal suffrage. Robespierre, who denounced censitary discrimination in the suffrage as an echo of ancient slavery, solemnized the right to life as the first of the imprescriptible rights of man. Point 47 The 1848 revolution, which sanctioned the triumph of universal male suffrage, also witnessed the emergence of demands for the right to work, this was the start of the second stage, whose protagonist was the socialist movement. In Germany, where the latter was especially strong, Bismarck sought to prevent a revolution from below by means of a revolution from above, which introduced the first vague elements of social security. Finally, the third stage, starting with the upheavals in Russia, has extended virtually down to the present. During the Second World War, in a famous speech on the Four Freedoms, Roosevelt declared that to destroy the seeds of Hitlerism it was necessary to achieve freedom from want, therewith impacting radically on existing socio-economic relations. The U.S. president's watchwords seem to delineate a project of social democracy which, as Kissinger correctly observes, went far beyond the prior American political tradition 48, in fact, maintains Hayek, went back to the infamous Bolshevik Revolution. Each stage in this process was marked by extremely bitter struggles. Here it is appropriate only to mention the years preceding the Bolshevik Revolution. In Milan in 1898, General Bava Bikaris had a crowd protesting at an increase in bread prices fired on by cannons, killing 100 unarmed demonstrators and earning him high honors, awarded by Umberto I, in the process. In the USA, Theodore Roosevelt declared himself ready for a similar trial of strength. Order will be kept at whatever cost. If it comes to shooting we shall shoot to hit. No blank cartridges or firing over the head of anybody, I like to see a mob handled by the regulars, or by good state guards, 
not overscrupulous about bloodshed, the sentiment now animating a large proportion of our people can only be suppressed as the Commune in Paris was suppressed, by taking ten or a dozen of their leaders out, standing them against a wall, and shooting them dead. I believe it will come to that 49. The three stages in the conquest of universal suffrage, involving the radical and Jacobin phase of the French Revolution, the development of the socialist movement, and the October Revolution, coincided with the stages of demands for, and the construction of, the social state, and this for a very simple reason. At bottom, it was a single process, which saw the subaltern classes demand recognition of their full human dignity. If denial of the latter primarily affected colonial populations, it did not spare the wretches of the capitalist metropolis. It was a stance that the liberal tradition only succeeded in surmounting with difficulty. For Mandeville, the wage laborer brought to mind a horse whom it was absolutely inappropriate to teach to read and write, should a horse know as much as a man, I should not desire to be his rider, and was equated by Burke and C. Eyes with an instrumentum vocal or human work tool, a bipedal machine, thus were adopted categories employed in classical antiquity to define slaves, point 50. We can now appreciate why, focusing on the excluded in both the colonies and the capitalist metropolis, Gramsci regarded communism as integral humanism, or a completion of the process of constructing the unity of the human race. Point 51. Contemporary democracy as the overcoming of the three major forms of discrimination. Demonization of the historical experience that began with the Bolshevik Revolution prevents us from understanding contemporary democracy. The latter is based on the principle that every individual is to be regarded as the bearer of inalienable rights, regardless of race, property, and sex, and hence presupposes overcoming the three major forms of discrimination, racial, sensitary, sexual, that were still alive and well on the eve of October 1917. Perhaps what Edgar Quinet affirmed of the French Revolution in his time also applies to the Bolshevik Revolution, the people who made it are not the people who derived most benefit from it. 52. It makes no sense to seek to place communism on a par with Nazism, the force that most consistently and brutally opposed overcoming racial discrimination and hence the advent of democracy. Whereas the Third Reich represented an attempt in conditions of total war to realize a planetary regime of white supremacy under German hegemony, the communist movement made a decisive contribution to overcoming racial discrimination and colonialism, whose legacy Nazism sought to inherit and radicalize. To seek to liquidate the epoch that began with the October Revolution as a period of crisis for democracy entails reverting to regarding colonial peoples, as well as other victims of the liberal tradition's exclusion clauses, as a quantite negligible, it means recolonizing history. The pages in which Gramsci criticized white supermen 53 and the reactionary attitudes of defenders of the West, and ironized about the fact that even for a prestigious philosopher like Henry Bergson humanity actually signifies West 54 could, and should, form part of any text of civic education and education in democracy. A similar honor might be accorded to the pages we have already cited in which Lenin draws attention to the sanguinary arrogance of the chosen nations towards red and black skins. Undoubtedly, other pages by the Russian revolutionary leader are repulsive. But this is also true of authors habitually elevated into the empyrean of the classics of liberal democracy. No one would wish to include in a textbook of civic education the pages where Locke regards slavery in the colonies as self-evident or where he invites readers to feel no compassion for the Irish papists, who at the time were the target of ferocious persecution and a veritable policy of colonial extermination. And no one would wish to include the pages in which Jefferson theorizes the natural inferiority of blacks, or those in which Mill demands absolute obedience of races deemed to be in their nunnage or semi-animal, or where he celebrates the opium war as a crusade for liberty. It remains the case that the October Revolution did not achieve the objectives pursued or proclaimed by it. One thinks of Lenin and the leaders of the Communist International who saw the World Soviet Republic already emerging, with the ultimate disappearance of classes, states, nations, the market, and religion. Not only did communism never come close to achieving this objective, it never succeeded in advancing towards it. 
are we therefore dealing with a self-evident outright failure? In reality, the discrepancy between programs and results is typical of every revolution. The French Jacobins did not realize or restore the ancient polis, the American revolutionaries did not create the society of small farmers and producers without a polarization between wealth and poverty, without a standing army and without a strong central power, the English revolutionaries did not revive the biblical society mythically transfigured by them. The experience of Christopher Columbus, who set out in search of the Indies but discovered America, might serve as a metaphor for understanding the objective dialectic of revolutionary processes. It was precisely Marx and Engels who underscored this point. In analyzing the French or English revolutions, they do not start with the subjective consciousness of their dramatis personae, or the ideologues who called and prepared the way for them, but with an examination of the objective contradictions that provoked them and the real characteristics of the politico-social continent exposed or revealed by the ensuing upheavals. The two theoreticians of historical materialism thus highlighted the discrepancy between subjective project and objective result, and ultimately explained the reasons for the creation, the inevitable creation, of such a discrepancy. Why should we proceed any differently when it comes to the October Revolution? It is worth recalling an indication by Engels, who, when assessing the English and French revolutions, observed, in order to secure even those conquests of the bourgeoisie that were ripe for gathering at the time, the revolution had to be carried considerably further. This seems, in fact, to be one of the laws of evolution of bourgeois society 55 there are no grounds for exempting the revolution inspired by Marx and Engels from the materialist methodology developed by them. Such is the context in which we must situate expectations of the withering away of the state, religion, the market, and any form of division of labor. This utopia, in which hopes of destroying the roots of the horrors on display in the First World War found exalted expression, has not withstood the test of reality. But in the absence of the historical movement inspired by it, we shall understand nothing of contemporary democracy. Future history will clarify whether this outcome exhausts the new politico-social continent in its entirety, or whether it constitutes but an initial, partial configuration of it. The fragile equilibrium on which contemporary democracy is based favors the latter hypothesis. Far from being affirmed without the contribution of the communist movement, we may now ask if democracy will withstand the disappearance of its challenge. Although pure and simple restorations are unknown in history, we should note not only the dismantling of the social state, but also and above all the explicit deletion, in neoliberalism, of economic and social rights from the catalogue of human rights. For Hayek, the three stages of demands for the social state, and universal suffrage, are the three stages of the advent of social or totalitarian democracy. Point 56. Even more disturbing is the tendency of historians like Paul Johnson and Niall Ferguson, who have enjoyed great media success, to justify, in fact, transfigure, colonialism and even imperialism and make claims for its enduring validity. They are not isolated figures. Among the undisputed matres appenser of neoliberalism and the dominant ideology is Ludwig von Mises. This is an author who in 1922 uncritically transfigured the history of colonialism. Even when they embarked on the Opium War, the West and Britain were doing nothing but pursuing their glorious vocation to elevate backward people to a state of civilization. But Mises does not stop there. He expresses the opinion that, along with the antisocial elements of every type resident in the West, the savage tribes of the colonies should be treated as dangerous animal s. This is a rather sinister declaration, which sounds like an indirect justification of the destruction of whole peoples denied their human dignity 57, as in the golden age of colonialism and democracy for the exclusive benefit of the master race. The Second Thirty Years' War, Total War, and Totalitarianism If we do not appreciate its compound of horror and emancipation, we are ill-placed to understand anything of the 20th century, and the dreadful pages of communism likewise prove incomprehensible in abstraction from the terrible pages of the history behind it. We left the splendid family of the Ancien Regime and Belle Epoque at the ceremonies in which it celebrated its power.
The outbreak of war instantly created a gulf of mutual hatred and contempt between the crowned heads, even though they were variously bound by kinship ties. There is a detail that reveals the true brutality of the struggle. The various sovereigns and rulers had hitherto recognized one another as members of one family even racially. Now, for the Entente's ideologues the Germans became Huns and Vandals, while Britain was branded as an Asiatic power by Thomas Mann, and France, Black France, became a Euro-African in Spengler's viewpoint 58 This mutual excommunication was symptomatic, the brutality that had always been regarded as legitimate in the case of inferior races now tended to erupt in the West, in the course of a war against an enemy who was expelled from the civilized world proper. This is the context in which to situate Wilhelm II's interpretation of the war between the Second Reich and Tsarist Russia as one between Slavs and Germans, a war that was racial in kind and which consequently precluded any possibility of peace or compromise. Subsequently, following the October Revolution, the West as a whole was unanimous in including Soviet Russia among the savages of the colonial world, and Hitler felt legitimized and encouraged in constructing a continental German empire in a gigantic space mired in barbarism, while drawing the most drastic lessons from the colonial tradition and further radicalizing them. 1914 was the beginning of what many historians characterize as the Second Thirty Years' War, a complex set of contradictions and conflicts of the most varied kinds which, having raged until 1945, were finally resolved only with the collapse of the USSR and the triumph of the American century. During this massive crisis, independently of the Bolshevik Revolution and often prior to it, we witness the emergence of all those constitutive features of the totalitarian and concentration camp universe that historical revisionism and the Black Book seek to deduce from the fateful October 1917. A merciless struggle required iron discipline on both sides, the regimentation of society reached unprecedented levels. The principle of individual responsibility was abrogated. This is demonstrated, for example in Italy, by the practice of decimation, the punishment even of the guiltless relatives of deserters, or reprisals against the civilian population carried out by firing into crowds, a measure which the British government did not shrink from in its efforts to quash the Irish rebellion, from 1916 until the achievement of independence by part of the unfortunate island. Like the abrogation of the principle of individual responsibility, what are today regarded as other characteristic aspects of the totalitarian regime made their appearance during the First World War. Is the totalitarian state an all-devouring Moloch? We have seen Weber remarking in 1917 that the state is accorded legitimate power over life, death, and liberty, Chapter 5. Too. And this also applies to countries with the oldest liberal traditions. In the USA, although safe on the other side of the Atlantic and sheltered from any danger of invasion, people could be sentenced to as much as 20 years in prison for having expressed an opinion liable to disturb the climate of sacred patriotic unity. Such patriotic unity was configured as a kind of single party, political, trade union or cultural organizations that challenged it were ruthlessly suppressed. A feature of the totalitarian phenomenon is the imposition of a strict state monopoly on information. This monopoly first appeared, and proved brilliantly effective, in the North American Republic. Seven days after declaring war, Wilson established a committee on public information that even regimented high culture. Another characteristic of the totalitarian regime is an admixture of control and violence by the state with control and violence from below, perpetrated by political organizations or militarized sectors of civil society. During the First World War, a very prominent role was played in the USA by vigilante groups unearthing, attacking, and terrorizing possible or potential traitors. Finally, according to Arendt, Totalitarianism is not content to impose a passive consensus, but demands an active consensus and active participation in a unanimous national effort. As a student of the propaganda techniques employed during the war observes, the belligerent country's objective, which was most effectively achieved in the United States, was to fuse the waywardness of individuals in the furnace of the war dance, to fuse thousands and millions of human beings into one amalgamated mass of hate and will and hope, as well as bellicose enthusiasm. 59 above all, the same slogans prevailed, 
total mobilization, total war, and even total politics. This is where we must start to explain the genesis of the term and reality of totalism, as it was initially dubbed, or totalitarianism proper. The Iron Fist targeted entire ethnic groups, suspected of maintaining links with the enemy or harboring sympathy for him. Hence resort to deportation. Among its victims were the Armenians, whom the Turkish government blamed for favoring collaboration with Christian and Tsarist Russia, which in its turn deported Jews, who were suspected of looking to Wilhelmine and Social Democratic Germany as a possible liberator from the yoke of anti-Semitism. The protagonist in the first chapter of the 20th century tragedy that ended in Auschwitz was a country allied with the liberal West and at war with Germany, which subsequently became the artisan of the final solution. In turn, during the First World War, Germans suffered violence and persecution not only in Tsarist Russia, but also in the USA. Sometimes they were marked out by a yellow symbol, and there were those who invoked the sterilization of a genetically tainted race. Point 60. Along with the practice of deportation, concentration camps emerged. The institution regarded as typifying the totalitarian regime was also set up in countries with the most stable liberal traditions. Immediately after the October Revolution, in the USA, McKellar, a Tennessee senator, proposed establishing a penal colony for political detainees on the island of Guam. The universe concentration air became a reality during the Second World War, when Roosevelt had American citizens of Japanese origin, including women and children, deported to concentration camps, even rounding them up from Latin America. In 1950, the McCarran Act was passed, setting up six concentration camps across the country to hold political prisoners. Among its promoters were representatives who subsequently became famous as presidents of the United States, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. 61. The diffusion in the most diverse countries of institutions and features typical of totalitarianism clarifies a crucial point, rather than in a particular ideology, its genesis is to be sought in war. We may venture a definition, totalitarianism is the political regime corresponding to total war, war that tends towards total control of the conduct and ideas not only of the combatant population, the quasi-totality of adult males, but also of the civilian population in the rear, itself an integral part of total mobilization in terms of production and ideology, and of civil society as such. It goes without saying that this new political regime assumes very different forms depending on the respective geopolitical situations, political traditions, and ideologies. As a result of its intimate connection with total war, totalitarianism received its first critical analysis from within the anti-war movement. As we know, it was above all Bukharin who warned against the new Leviathan, compared with which Thomas Hobbes' fantasy seems child's play. The Russian revolutionary drew a precise, impressive picture of the super-Leviathan that also materialized in the state of which he was to become a leader and, subsequently, a victim. Russia and Germany as the epic entree of the Second Thirty Years' War Totalitarianism culminated in the two countries at the center of the Second Thirty Years' War. In this regard, a comparison between Bolshevism and Nazism is not merely appropriate, but mandatory. This does not mean sharing the approach of historians who describe the lives of Stalin and Hitler as parallel, as if everything could be explained by two power-crazy, utterly unscrupulous personalities. Instead, it involves analyzing the answers ventured by two different, antagonistic movements to the challenges represented by two objective situations that were not without their similarities. Let us focus first on Soviet Russia, obliged to confront a permanent state of emergency. If we examine the period from October 1917 to 1953, the year of Stalin's death, we see that it was marked by at least four or five wars and two revolutions, both of them followed by civil wars. In the West, the aggression of Wilhelm II's Germany, until the Brest-Litovsk peace, was followed by that first of the Entente and then of Hitlerite Germany. Finally, we have the Cold War, punctuated by bloody local conflicts, which threatened at any moment to turn into a hot war of major proportions, involving the use of atomic weapons. In the East, 
with its invasion of Manchuria we find Japan, which only withdrew from Siberia in 1922 and Sakhalin in 1925, engaged in a menacing military deployment on the borders of the USSR, which was involved in large-scale border clashes in 1938 and 1939, prior to the official start of the Second World War. Moreover, the aforementioned were total wars, both because they did not proceed from a declaration of war, both the Entente and the Third Reich abstained from one, and because they were bound up with civil war and the invaders' stated intention of overthrowing the existing regime. Hitler's campaign explicitly aimed at the extermination of the Oriental Untermenschen. To these wars must be added internal upheavals and civil wars. That is, in addition to October 1917, we must bear in mind the revolution from above that was the forced collectivization and industrialization of the countryside from 1929 onwards. Revolution and war were closely connected, given that collectivization and industrialization were, or, at any rate, were considered, necessary if the USSR was to be capable of facing the dreaded new aggression, already clearly heralded by Hitler in main camp. The key moment was the revolution from above and without imposed by Stalin from Moscow on a countryside inhabited by national minorities traditionally branded as barbarians. The white man's burden now assumed a peculiar form, with the Russian city exporting, socialist, civilization into the Asian countryside by force of arms. Ethnic conflict intermeshed with political and social conflict. The conflict between poor or landless peasants and more or less affluent peasants already existed. But it was exacerbated, and rendered fanatical, by an ideological approach to the tragedy of starvation rampant in urban areas, responsibility for which was exclusively laid at the door of the money-grubbing kulak, a kind of vampire. The slightest opposition and resistance was ruthlessly repressed. Not only was the gulag greatly expanded, but large-scale forced labor now became an element of economic and war planning. In an irony of history, having waved the banner of the slaves' revolt in the colonies, Soviet Russia ended up reproducing some features of the colonial tradition. But these should not be exaggerated. Despecification was invariably politico-moral, not racial. Forced labor was not a hereditary condition. We have seen the Soviet leadership stress that the son is not answerable for the father. At the same time, precisely because people were sentenced to forced labor not on account of their ethnic affiliation, but for the purposes of political repression, this also afforded a narrow escape route for counter-revolutionaries. This became clear after the outbreak of the war, detainees could be released from the Gulag and were even offered the possibility of social mobility and promotion, Chapter 5. 9. Let us now take a look at the other country at the epic entree of the Second Thirty Years' War. Bled white and defeated on the battlefield, shaken by the November 1918 revolution at the close of the First World War, which offered chauvinists a pretext for diffusing the myth of the stab in the back, humiliated by the Versailles Treaty, Germany subsequently experienced a devastating economic crisis that further accentuated its internal divisions. Having arrived in power, Nazism launched a preventive civil war to liquidate any potential opposition to its revanchist program and to make surrender on the internal front, which had occurred in 1918, impossible. Yet despite initial triumphs, the country once again became embroiled in a hopeless war on two fronts, attacked not only by regular armies, but also by the partisan resistance that sprang up in all the territories occupied by the Third Reich. To equate the Soviet Union and Hitler's Germany as quintessential expressions of totalitarianism is, in one respect, a banality. Where should we expect to find the basic characteristics of the political regime corresponding to total war, if not in the two countries at the center of the Second Thirty Years' War? It is no surprise if the universe concentration air assumed a markedly more brutal form there than, for example, in the USA which was protected from the danger of invasion by the ocean and which, in the course of the massive war, suffered loses and devastation far inferior to those of the other main participants. Around a century and a half earlier, on the eve of the promulgation of the new federal constitution, we have seen Hamilton explaining that the limitation of power and establishment of the rule of law had succeeded in two countries of an insular kind,
which were sheltered by the seas from the threats of rival powers. It is worth noting that during the Second Thirty Years' War all the countries of mainland Europe, located as they were in the Epicontre, or immediate vicinity of the Epicontre, of the great historical crisis, experienced the collapse of representative, liberal institutions at different times and in different ways. To a certain extent, totalitarianism also emerged in the USA when involved in two world wars. In the 20th century, an insular position was no longer a completely insurmountable obstacle. But the degree of brutality displayed by the totalitarian regime continued to be bound up with different geopolitical contexts, as well as different ideological and political traditions. Naturally, the permanent state of emergency was not only an objective fact. In Nazism it was also the result of a political program which, in aspiring to world domination, ended up making the state of war permanent. Similar considerations apply to communism. When it obsessively pursued the utopia of a society undefiled by contradictions or conflicts, it ended up generating a variety of permanent revolution and war, this is what occurred especially during the Chinese Cultural Revolution. From this standpoint too, the comparison is wholly legitimate. In another respect, however, equation of the Soviet Union with Hitler's Germany is inane. In the former case, totalitarianism was the result of an admixture of total war, imposed from without, and permanent revolution and civil war, to which, by contrast, communist ideology made a major contribution. It also goes without saying that the Third Reich is not reducible to a mere episode of common criminality, as Bertolt Brecht seemed to believe when he wrote The Resistible Rise of Arturo Ui. In it we find a convergence of three historical processes, the logic of total war, taken to extremes by inordinate imperialist ambition, the legacy of the colonial tradition, whose brutality was further radicalized by the attempt to return peoples of ancient civilization, situated in the very heart of Europe, to the state of primitive tribes, and the motif of revolution as conspiracy, which led Hitler to identify the Jews as the secret architects of the Bolshevik October and to seek Germany's and Europe's salvation from the Bolshevik and Asiatic threat in elimination of the Jewish virus. It hardly needs saying that, far from being attributable to the October Revolution, these historical processes and ideological motives derived from the world against which the latter rebelled. The Choreography of Categories In contrast, let us see how the authors of the Black Book of Communism proceed. Having asserted the temporal priority of the communist genocide over the Nazi one, they do their utmost to demonstrate that the former was much more imposing in quantitative terms. Wholly absorbed in their efforts to pile statistic on statistic, under the illusion of rendering their calculus invulnerable, they do not even question the categories employed. It is important to make good this lacuna. Let us start with genocide. Referring to the First World War, Bukharin and Luxembourg respectively spoke of a horrible corpse factory and mass extermination and genocide, Volker Mord. Why should this denunciation be less credible than that which today aims to demonize the history of the communist movement as such? Why should the horror of an international war be assessed differently from the horror of a civil war? The soldiers who refused or hesitated to engage in military actions, in the knowledge that they entailed certain death, became targets for their own side, they were even bombarded by heavy artillery in a Russia determined, against Bolshevik opposition, to pursue the war at any cost. Perhaps denunciations from the communist side are to be regarded as irrelevant. Very well. There are US historians who refer to genocide in connection with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as well as the carpet bombing of Dresden and Tokyo, which, although carried out with conventional weapons, destroyed the civilian population of whole cities. Hence we possess all the relevant elements for a serious discussion of the category of genocide. But historical revisionism and the Black Book do not like unnecessary conceptual complications. For them everything is clear. There are two types of genocide, racial genocide, which was committed by the Nazis and them alone, the colonial tradition is repressed, and class genocide, which was committed by the communists and came first in chronological order, all that aside, the Armenian tragedy is ignored. 
and thus one can ultimately demonstrate the equivalence of Nazism and Communism. Obviously, the meaning of class genocide is likewise assumed to be immediately clear and unequivocal. Point 62 Yet we find ourselves confronted with a kind of yellow algorithm. The second term refers to a genos, a race defined in naturalistic terms, subsuming every individual member regardless of his or her subjective consciousness and concrete behavior. The first term refers to history rather than nature, and is used to indicate a social group with label, shifting boundaries. The Communist Manifesto is not the only text to highlight the revolutionary role of transfugs from the dominant class. The thesis is clearly present in Lenin's What is to be Done, which in fact insists even more forcefully on the decisive contribution of intellectuals from the bourgeoisie to the development of revolutionary theory. In turn, the revolutionary militant, the Tribune of the People, has the task of diffusing this theory not only within the proletariat, but among all classes. It should be added that membership of a class does not always possess the same significance. There is a bourgeoisie that plays a progressive role not only in colonial countries, but also, according to Lenin, in all those situations where imperialist oppression puts the national question back on the agenda. On the other hand, it is precisely the black book that underscores the obsession with indoctrination in communist concentration camps, in Maoist China, there certainly were studies involved. But inasmuch as it aims to alter the victim's behavior, indoctrination indicates an absence of genocidal intent, defined as the closure of any escape route for members of the targeted group, defined, that is, as the project of destroying a group regardless of the conduct of the individuals comprising it. Indoctrination, and the altered conduct it induces, also changes its victim's treatment. At least as regards China, the Black Book acknowledges this, penitentiaries were above all places to teach. Bad students who had been unruly or slow to learn. The solution, was quite simple, change people's ideas 63 however horrible this universe concentration air, it cannot be described as class genocide. Nor is an imprecise, unthinking use of categories conducive to historical or moral judgment. Writing of post-communist Russia, Maurice Duveridger, having criticized the collapse in average life expectancy attributable to the privileged few who have succeeded in accumulating enormous wealth that is speculative and parasitic in origin, when not openly illegal, pronounces a terrible verdict, it is a veritable genocide of the elderly. Point 64. Following the genocide of soldiers and the genocide of kulaks, counter-revolutionaries, we have the genocide of the impoverished elderly. To this list we might add the genocide of political opponents, e.g. that which struck hundreds of thousands of communists in Indonesia in 1965. In reality, in all these instances the relevant specification, which refers to a group with shifting, mutable boundaries, comes into contradiction with the general category, which refers to a naturalistically defined group with very precise, inviolable boundaries. The individual elderly poor person can seek to escape misery, e.g. through begging or thieving, the individual soldier can hope that his ability will get him through until peace arrives, individual kulaks or communists can, if time permits, renounce the political positions that they have hitherto adopted. Members of an ethnic group whose destruction has been decided cannot alter their own identity and group affiliation by their conduct. And that is what defines genocide. Hence certain episodes in the two world wars do approximate to genocide proper. The individual inhabitant of Hiroshima or Nagasaki could not escape the destruction, but this does not apply, obviously, to individual members of the Japanese people. As regards the First World War, we have seen an eminent British historian, Taylor, remarking that some 50 million Africans and 250 million Indians were involved, without consultation, in a war of which they understood nothing. Colonial inhabitants were simply rounded up and deported thousands of miles to be inducted into the corpse factory, and this not on account of behavior deemed unacceptable, but simply because they were members of an inferior race, utilizable as cannon fodder by a master race. Such behavior on the part of colonial powers in some ways resembles genocide. Although not rigorous,
in the Black Book of Capitalism foreshadowed by Bukharin and Luxembourg, the category of genocide, or horrible corpse factory and mass extermination, is used more persuasively than in the Black Book of Communism. But let us see how class genocide was committed. It was primarily the result of man-made famine. The one that occurred in China following the Great Leap Forward of 1958 caused 30 million deaths, almost a third of the total number of victims attributed to communism. Once again, we encounter a category on whose history and meaning historians should reflect. Let us also seek to fill this lacuna, formulating a preliminary question, without going too far back, when in the 20th century did starving an entire people become a weapon of war? We have seen Weber in the immediate aftermath of the First World War draw attention to the hundreds of thousands of German victims of the British naval blockade, which, much more than on combatants, impacted on the civilian population and the weakest and most defenseless. Obviously, the great sociologist was at the same time a fervent German chauvinist. So it is worth noting that Gramsci's verdict on the subject was even more severe. In an article of 1916, he indignantly condemned a measure that sought to lock up the German people to enfeeble it, to stamp it out. An accusation repeated when the victors maintained the blockade long after the signature of the armistice, until the vanquished agreed to sign a humiliating, vengeful peace treaty Vienna is decomposing, its human component is dissolving, children are dying, women are dying, the population is languishing and expiring in an economic prison with no possibility of escape. 65. With reference to the First World War, not only Luxembourg, but also Gramsci ultimately spoke of genocide, genocide which, in the Italian communists' denunciation, found its most concentrated expression in the man-made starvation of a whole people. Herbert Hoover likewise expressed horror at the continuation of the blockade. Subsequently, however, it was Hoover, director of the American Relief Administration under Wilson and future president of the USA, who, to check the Bolshevik infection, formulated a brutal strategy, peoples inclined to let themselves be seduced by the example of Soviet Russia must know that they would thereby risk absolute famine and starvation. 66. Meanwhile, the food weapon was employed against those who had already succumbed to the infection. In Italy, this elicited contempt not only from Gramsci, but also from Guido de Ruggiero, the Entente's blockade which was intended to destroy Bolshevism is instead killing Russian men, women, and children. While the liberal philosopher pointed the finger at the Entente starvers in 1922,67 today's ideologues attribute man-made famine exclusively to communism. However, as its very name suggests, food diplomacy was openly theorized in the USA, which ruthlessly practices it to this day, for example, against Cuba, after having long practiced it in the Cold War years, and no less ruthlessly, against the People's Republic of China and, more recently, Iraq. Men, women, and children, guilty only of being Cubans, Chinese, or Iraqis, have been condemned to the starvation menacingly held out by Hoover. The Black Book overlooks all this. Paradoxically, in employing the category of man-made famine it seems to be inspired by Stalin.68 on the eve of the forced collectivization of agriculture, to demonstrate its utter indispensability, he accused the Kulaks of hoarding food supplies so as to increase prices and garner higher profits, and this regardless of the terrible consequences in the cities of this kind of man-made famine. What remains unclear is the degree of intentionality of the action. This also applies to the Black Book. In fact, there is at least one instance where such intentionality is explicitly excluded. In China, the Great Leap was a disaster of more colossal proportions than the famines, however catastrophic, which have punctuated the history of the great Asian country. But undoubtedly it was not Mao's intention to kill so many of his compatriots. 69 Why, then, equate political responsibility and deliberate homicide? And does man-made famine refer to the one or the other? Not only are two forms of behavior confounded, but with its silences the charge of man-made famine spares precisely those responsible for acts explicitly aimed at inflicting starvation on the enemy.
Class genocide and man-made famine refer to a regime branded as totalitarian in all its various manifestations throughout its history. The category of totalitarianism is likewise deployed in merely ideological fashion. What is lacking is any attempt to reconstruct the history of total institutions. When did the concentration camp emerge and how did it spread? The reader learns nothing about its use by Spain in the deadly struggle against the Cuban Revolution, or by Britain at war with the Boers, or by the USA engaged in repressing a rebellion in the Philippines and waging war on Japan. From such silence one infers that use of concentration camps was restricted to communism and Nazism, which therefore can and must be equated. QED. Genocide, man-made famine, totalitarianism, in one way or another, these three categories date back to the denunciation of capitalism and imperialism, of bourgeois society, made by communism in its time. Now such accusations are turned against it, but without a minimum of historical and critical awareness. According to the Black Book, communism in all its forms and representatives is to be regarded as totalitarian, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Ho Chi Minh, Castro, Ortega. And the chaos of the Cultural Revolution in China? Simple, an anarchic totalitarianism.70 But would the adjective not appear to negate the substantive? And what are we to understand when we read that Cuba is still dominated by totalitarianism in the tropics? 71 Is it totalitarianism in a bathing suit dance to the beat of the samba? Here is the explanation the regime continued to marginalize religious institutions and believers, though claiming that it would allow Cubans to profess their faith freely, it subjected those who did so to repressive measures, such as forbidding them access to university education or to jobs in the civil service 72 But if this is totalitarianism, then the German Federal Republic, which did not shrink from Beruf's verbat against communists, would have to be regarded as totalitarian. Above all, when accompanied by threats of, and attempts at, invasion, the embargo creates a de facto state of war. The Cuban communist regime would not appear to have reacted to the situation with measures more drastic than those implemented in the USA during two world wars. Talman Sophism The fact is that in the Black Book, as in an immense literature, the deeds and misdeeds of communism are compared not with the actual behavior of the world it sought to challenge, about which the strictest silence reigns, but with liberalism's declarations of principle. In the light of these, the historical experience that began with the Bolshevik Revolution emerges in all its abjectness. The sophistical character of comparison between such heterogeneous magnitudes is patent. It might be called Talman's sophism, after the name of the distinguished scholar who in the aftermath of the Second World War condemned totalitarian democracy from Rousseau to Stalin, contrasting it with a liberalism that supposedly abhorred coercion and violence, Chapter 210. This appraisal not only completely ignores real history, but also proceeds extremely selectively when it comes to declarations of principle by different exponents of liberalism. As we know, the latter did not hesitate to theorize slavery or despotism for barbarians, not to mention war, and, in states of emergency, made provision for dictatorship in the metropolis. All this is ignored by Tallman, who, when referring to the political tradition he cherishes, prefers to soar into the firmament of hagiography. This manner of argument has triumphed in our day. The tragic history of communism, denounced as the very embodiment of totalitarianism, is set against an idyllic portrait of Britain and the USA, or other countries governed by the liberal rules of the game. But what of such rules in the colonies and in relations with populations of colonial origin? And what of such rules in situations of acute crisis? Marx denounced a key aspect of Tallman's sophism, silence about the colonies, in advance, the profound hypocrisy and inherent barbarism of bourgeois civilization lies unveiled before our eyes, turning from its home, where it assumes respectable forms, to the colonies, where it goes naked 73 after the tragedies of the 20th century, the other key aspect becomes clear, abstraction from states of emergency, starting with that prompted by total war. Let us seek to trace the history of the last 150 years employing Tallman's sophism,
but turning it against its usual beneficiaries. Let us start with the present. The Italian judiciary has given vent to suspicions of the CIA's complicity in the Piazza Fontana massacre, and it is now public knowledge that in the post-war period the USA was ready to intervene at any point to cancel an electoral result favorable to the communists by force of arms. To this we may add the long list of military interventions in Latin America, often on behalf of ferocious military dictatorships. And now let us read Stalin, who in 1952 called on communists to pick up the banner of bourgeois democratic freedoms, and the banner of national independence, cast aside by the bourgeoisie.74. These were the years when the communist movement was mobilized in a global campaign to collect signatures for peace and a ban on nuclear weapons. On the other side, by contrast, Truman entertained a radical idea for securing complete victory in Korea, which emerges from a diary entry from January 1952. An ultimatum could be issued to the enemy countries, spelling out in advance that a failure to comply would entail the destruction of the largest cities and every manufacturing plant in China and the Soviet Union, see Chapter 6, 11. This was not a hypothetical private reflection. Even after the end of the Korean War, the atomic bomb was brandished against the People's Republic of China on several occasions, and the threat was all the more credible given the fresh, terrible memory of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Let us proceed backwards. During the Second World War, along with the two cities wiped out by the atom bomb, the Americans and British set numerous other Japanese and German towns and cities ablaze. The destruction of the civilian population was not coincidental. What lay behind it was a precise strategic design. Dresden was attacked because it was full of refugees, women, the elderly, children, using a particular technique. First of all, windows and roofs were destroyed with high explosives, which were followed by incendiary bombs that could thereby more easily penetrate the interior of houses and set fire to carpets, curtains, furniture and so forth. The distinction between combatants and non-combatants seems to have been abolished. Roosevelt explicitly asserted this when, as we saw earlier, he declared, we have got to be tough with Germany, and I mean the German people, not just the Nazis. We either have to castrate the German people, or you have got to treat them in such a manner that they can't just go on reproducing people who want to continue the way they have in the past. And now let us read Stalin, who in August 1942, while Nazi barbarism was the rampaging in the USSR, was concerned to make a clear distinction, it would be ludicrous to identify Hitler's clique with the German people, with the German state. The experience of history indicates that Hitler's come and go, but the German people and the German state remain. The strength of the Red Army lies, finally, in the fact that it does not and cannot feel racial hatred for other peoples, including the German people. Let us take a further step back. During the struggle against the Bolsheviks, the Russian whites, supported by the Umtant, sparked pogroms of appalling proportions in which around 60,000 Jews lost their lives. Echoing the thesis of the Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy, Churchill personally denounced Lenin as the high priest and head of a formidable sect, the most formidable sect in the world. Indeed, to counter anti-Semitic agitation, the Russian revolutionary leader, in addition to taking drastic measures, mounted a major propaganda campaign and had a speech recorded on disc so that it could reach the millions of illiterates. As is well known, the October Revolution broke out in the wake of the struggle against the First World War. Wilson celebrated it as a holy war, the holiest in all history, U.S. soldiers were crusaders, protagonists of a transcendent enterprise whose sword shone with divine light. By contrast, in addition to genocide, Rosa Luxemburg referred to an atmosphere of ritual murder, while Lenin denounced the fact that in all belligerent countries even the home fronts had become military convict prisons. Point 75 to stifle such protest, repression from above intersected with repression from below, this is a key characteristic of fascism. Thus, in the USA the Ku Klux Klan staged a baleful return and, even after the war was over, targeted those suspected of insufficient patriotic loyalty and racial homogeneity, Jews, communists and, above all, blacks.
corresponding to the anti-Jewish pogroms incited by white Russians were cases of lynching of blacks in the USA, which had been going on for decades. In its turn, the oppression of blacks referred back to the lot of inferior races. In 1890, the massacre at Wounded Knee, with the killing of defenseless women and children, sealed the conquest of the Far West and the well-nigh complete erasure of redskins from the face of the earth. These were the years when Theodore Roosevelt thundered against sentimental humanitarians who sympathized with the fate of the Native Americans, and who were to be regarded as worse than the professional criminal class. These were the years when, in Stalin's ringing words, scores and hundreds of millions of Asiatic and African peoples, usually remained outside the field of vision, white and black, civilized and uncivilized, were not put on the same plane. Only Leninism laid bare this crying incongruity, broke down the wall between whites and blacks, between Europeans and Asiatics, between the civilized and uncivilized slaves of imperialism 76. One more step backwards. While Europe witnessed the birth of the working class movement inspired by Marxism, in the USA another wave of deportations removed the Native Americans ever farther west, confining them to reservations that resembled concentration camps, where it became increasingly difficult to counter hunger and the cold, and where bedclothes deliberately infected with smallpox were sometimes introduced. At the same time, in the South, blacks were slaves. In the event of rebellion, they were subjected to the most refined tortures, in accordance with an old tradition that involved roasting the victims over a slow fire, in an ordeal that could last up to eight or ten hours. Thus continued the idyllic proceedings which, according to Capital, characterized the dawn of the era of capitalist production. Point seventy seven the old slavery had not been abolished when a new form of it developed, destined to survive the civil war, the trade in coolies imported from India and China. It was Engels who denounced this new disgrace. The history sketched above invents absolutely nothing. But it is equally ideological, in as much as it contrasts the liberal West's concrete political conduct with the most noble aspects of the communist movement's ideological platform, ignoring its concrete behavior and the most terrible pages in its history. Yet this, in an inverted mirror image, and in even more heavily ideological fashion, is how the Black Book of Communism proceeds. It is a literary genre that ill becomes historical research. Comprehension of massive conflicts presupposes analysis of the interacting behavior of the antagonists. The presumption on the part of one of the interested parties, the one that emerged victorious, to erect itself into judge of the other, condemning it on the basis of criteria to which it declines to submit, is ridiculous. Rather than a work of history, the Black Book of Communism is a kind of historiographical caricature of the Nuremberg trial. Conflict of Happiness, Conflict of Liberty We have seen that the 20th century signaled the advent of democracy. We may now pose a further question, was the 20th century the one in which the phenomena of deportation, concentration camps, genocide first made their appearance? Or was it the century when all these horrors erupted into Europe? Unless we want to repress or transfigure the colonial tradition, the second answer manifestly dictates itself. Hence if the horror of the 20th century is undeniable, escape into the past, to happier, less cruel centuries, is problematic. Where would it end? The 19th century? Among the innumerable massacres that marked it, it is enough to think of the decimation of the Congo's population, referred to by Arendt. Moreover, it was the century in whose wake Hitler situated himself, committed as he was to reviving the achievements of colonial expansionism. The 18th century? The fate reserved for the internal colonies of Scotland and Ireland by England was terrible, while between the two Atlantic coasts and in America the Black Holocaust, in the definition ventured by descendants of black slaves, or the American Holocaust, according descendants of the Native Americans, was consummated. These are tragedies that were already in full swing in the 17th century, the century which, with its Thirty Years' War proper, serves as a reference point for numerous historians in interpreting the 20th century. Must we go back even further, to the 16th or 15th centuries?
We then encounter what an eminent intellectual, Svetan Todorov, has characterized as the greatest genocide in human history. Moreover, it would be bizarre to seek to counterpose the epoch of the conquest to the century of Hitler's infamies, given that with his war of extermination against the natives he might be regarded as the last of the conquistadores. Escape from the 20th century into the past secretes an implicit Eurocentric and negationist logic, in this instance, of the Black Holocaust, the American Holocaust, and the innumerable massacres of the colonial tradition. While escaping to happy times past and denying the emancipatory charge of the communist movement proved fruitless, the latter's major contribution to the horror of the 20th century cannot be denied. What historical victory could ever justify it? In fact, on closer inspection, did not the catastrophe precisely begin with Marx's presumption in sacrificing morality on the altar of the philosophy of history and the impending radiant future? This is the principal theme in the tendency, today extremely widespread, to search for a kind of philosophical original sin, reverting from the October Revolution to the philosopher with whom it identified. This view results in a Manichaean contrast between a, liberal, political tradition attentive to the claims of morality and a political tradition incurably deaf to them. This is Talman's sophism, with which we are familiar, only now, rather than in historiographical form, it is presented sub specie philosophia. Yet in this version too it can easily be inverted. Having painted a dreadful picture that fully accords with the reality of British colonial rule in Ireland, an eminent English liberal historian, Trevelyan, stressed what in his view was the essential aspect, the subjugation of the unhappy island saved Protestantism in Europe and enabled the British Empire to launch forth strongly on its career of prosperity, freedom and expansion overseas. 78 Terrible human costs are justified in the name of a country's imperial mission, we are in 1942, in the midst of the catastrophe caused by the Third Reich or the Germanic Third Empire. And now let us compare the English historian's philosophy with Marx's. The latter recognized that, despite its arbitrary and brutal character, British colonial rule in India had a modernizing impact. In this sense, progress had been realized, but progress resembling that hideous pagan idol, who would not drink the nectar but from the skulls of the slain, 79. This is not an isolated point. Marx's main work can be read as a critical reflection on the bourgeois and Western philosophy of history. Having stressed that capital comes dripping from head to toe, from every pore, with blood and dirt, converting Africa into a preserve for the commercial hunting of blackskins and bringing about the extirpation, enslavement and entombment in minds of the indigenous population in America, the chapter on original accumulation in capital ironically paraphrases the motto with which Virgil summarized the foundation of a city destined by the gods to rule the world, Tanti Moli's Erat.80. This denunciation remained operative in Lenin, who defended the claims of the red and black skins against the arrogance of a few chosen nations. The search for the original philosophical sin that allegedly explains the horrors of our time does not stop at Marx. Behind the Bolsheviks we find the model of the Jacobin terror, whose protagonists often referred to Rousseau. Such is the mandatory starting point, the organicism of the author of the social contract, who presumes to sacrifice individuals on the altar of the general will and an omnivorous whole. In reality, any such attitude was so alien to the philosopher that in a letter of September 27, 1766, written when the contradictions resulting in the French Revolution were already evident, he asserted, the blood of one man is more valuable than the liberty of the whole human race. 81. Yet Rousseau continues to be viewed as the father of the terror, and grandfather of the gulag. Set against him is once again the Anglo-American liberal tradition, replete, so we are assured, with sacred respect for the claims of morality and the concrete individual. However, Less than three decades after the letter we have just mentioned, we encounter another, no less eloquent one. It is the summer of 1792 and the terror is already on the horizon in France. In seeking to justify it, the author of this letter declares that, rather than tolerating the triumph of the cause of despotism, I would have seen half the earth desolate. More precisely, 
were there but an Adam and an Eve left in every country, and left free, it would be better than it now is. The author was Jefferson.82 A direct line seems to lead from the view expressed here to a slogan that became widespread in the worst years of the Cold War, dominated by the specter of nuclear holocaust, better dead than red. The liberty of the human race seems to require much more than the blood of one man. This is a complete inversion of Rousseau's position. The Jacobins did indeed invoke him. At this point, we might be tempted to sigh, if only they had complied with the author they venerated, instead of providing the Bolsheviks with a model in the terror. Unfortunately, the criterion formulated by the Genevan philosopher does not withstand the test of reality. On the one hand, it is too restrictive. Taken literally, it would require condemnation of any revolution and any war. Even an assassination attempt on Hitler would be difficult to justify, and it would be very hard to justify a police operation that involved shedding blood. The police, the army, and the judiciary, at least in countries where the death penalty is provided for, operate on the basis of the presupposition that the blood of one or more human beings is worth less than the liberty, not of the human race, but of a particular political community. The state as such entails this principle. In Rousseau's letter, we can read a vague aspiration to the extinction of states, the anarchical utopia adopted by Marx and, subsequently, the Bolsheviks themselves. We are returned to the vicinity of a revolution which, at first blush, seems separated by an abyss from the criterion formulated by Rousseau. What becomes clear is that such a criterion is, on the other hand, too broad. It is a pious illusion to believe that adhering to the absolute value of the individual is in and of itself an antidote to revolutionary upheavals and the ensuing shedding of blood. Rousseau reiterates that absolute value when, in the discourse on political economy, he asserts that the social contract would risk being null if in the state there perished even a single citizen who could have been assisted, if even a single trial were to end with a manifestly unjust sentence it would be imperative to remedy that eventuality, uninhibited by the pretext of the public good, or public order, that terrible curse.83 No society was, or is, in a position to meet the challenge contained in such a view. This is where we must start from to understand the dialectic that developed in the French Revolution. In articulating the new idea of happiness, Saint just formulated an extremely ambitious and pugnacious program, not a single poor, unhappy being in the state will be tolerated, let Europe learn that you no longer wish to see either an unhappy being or an oppressor on French territory 84 we are a few months from the fateful Thermidor 1794, which saw Saint just go to the guillotine along with Robespierre. Two years later, this program was adopted verbatim by Bebeuf, in a speech to the judges of the tribunal that shortly afterwards likewise sentenced him to death.85. As well as invoking Saint Just, Babiot referred to the 1793 Constitution, Article 34 of which states that there is oppression of the social body when there is oppression of a single one of its members. But the politico-social order already tends to be impugned by poverty and unhappiness, which are no longer treated as a natural calamity or divine punishment, as in the ideology of the Ancien Regime. The misery and unhappiness of a single human being suffice for a condition of oppression to obtain, but then, continues the Jacobin constitution, insurrection becomes the most sacred of rights and the most imperative of duties. From a factor of potential conservatism in Rousseau's letter of 1766, the sentiment of the absolute value of the individual is converted into a tool of permanent revolution. In no instance is it permissible to sacrifice the concrete individual to society. Formulated with an eye to the future, highlighting the dangers contained in any project of social transformation, this categorical imperative can elicit resignation. Formulated with an eye to the present, with its suffering and sacrifices, it opens up a chasm of endless negation. The criterion stated by Rousseau is too narrow for any concrete political action and project to be capable of meeting it, and too broad to be capable, if not of blocking, then at least of containing and screening impulses to rebellion. The unhappiness of a single human being is intolerable. 
Babyuk seems to realize the utopian character of such a demand and, in fact, sometimes prefers to speak of the happiness of the greatest number. This is a formula subsequently found in Bentham. The idea of happiness thus becomes more realistic. The unhappiness of a certain number of persons is now taken into account. The possible conflict between the happiness of some and that of others is now sometimes configured as a conflict between liberties. Focusing on the British colonists in America, where a kind of local self-government by white colonists who were often slave owners obtained, Smith observed that slavery could more easily be suppressed under a despotic government than a free one, where every law is made by their masters, who will never pass anything prejudicial to themselves. From this the lectures on jurisprudence draw an extraordinary conclusion, the freedom of the free was the cause of the great oppression of the slaves. And as they are the most numerous part of mankind, no human person will wish for liberty in a country where this institution is established. 86 What a scandal from the standpoint of contemporary apologetic liberals is the preference indirectly expressed here for despotic government as the only form that can eliminate the institution of slavery. This anticipates the political and moral dilemmas of the American people either side of the Civil War. We can restate the political dilemma. Contrary to Smith, it involved choosing not between liberty and despotic government, but between the freedom of blacks reduced to slavery and the freedom of their owners. Slavery was only abolished following a bloody war, conducted by Lincoln with remorseless Jacobin energy, and a subsequent military dictatorship over the secessionist states. When the Union abandoned the Iron Fist, whites were once again granted habeas corpus and local self-government, but blacks were deprived not only of political rights, but also, in large part, of civil rights. The political dilemma was also a moral dilemma. Let us leave aside self-declared defenders of the institution of slavery. Those who hoped for a gradual, painless reform process accepted an albeit temporary reduction of black slaves to means and things, the more radical abolitionists, who first pressed for a confrontation and then supported the military dictatorship over the South, in effect accepted the reduction of the victims of the war and subsequent military dictatorship to means to an end. The situation was reversed with the return of the ex-slaves to semi-serfdom and the condition of sacrificial victims, immolated on the altar of newfound harmony within the white community and restored democracy for the master race. The Civil War achieved a lasting result, the abolition of slavery, but at the cost of a terrible bloodbath, the number of casualties was higher than that caused on the U.S. side by two world wars put together. Was it worth it? Might it not have been better, suggest revisionist historians, to await the natural course of things, especially given that acceleration of the process of emancipation did not have the anticipated effects? What has been called the Second American Revolution evinces a disastrous balance sheet. It did not achieve liberty for blacks, it abolished slavery only to make way for the arbitrary violence of the regime of white supremacy. Certainly, the international influence of the abolitionist revolution weighs on the other side of the scale. It occurred in the same period as the abolition of serfdom in Russia and at a time when the most odious aspects of what not only Marx, but an abundant literature, denounced as wage slavery or white slavery were being challenged in Western Europe. We should also not lose sight of the fact that 1867 saw the passage in Britain of the Second Reform Bill, which significantly extended the suffrage. At a time when American blacks were conquering, or seemed to be conquering, political rights along with civil rights, it was hard to deny the white working class the former. Again in 1884, during demonstrations to secure the Third Reform Act and a further extension of citizenship, British workers waved flags invoking the Union's struggle to abolish slavery. 87. That gesture might seem rather naive to contemporary historians, it appears to ignore the white supremacy which had supervenate in the interim. Compared with the pre-Civil War years, the condition of blacks had in a sense even deteriorated. They were now forced to endure a situation of permanent isolation, intimidation, and terror, cases of lynching multiplied. The restoration of racial hierarchy, which had been experienced by its victims as natural for so long, but which had then fallen into crisis, required a surcharge of violence and brutality.
something similar occurred after the October Revolution and the appeal addressed to the slaves in the colonies. In Ethiopia and Eastern Europe, the reassertion of colonialism and the process of recolonization assumed forms that were all the more horrible given the difficulties encountered in reversing the course of history. The abolition of slavery, following a bloody war conducted as a crusade for freedom, strengthened the North American Republic's democratic good conscience and sense of mission. Colonial and imperial impulses received a strong impetus, as demonstrated by the war with Spain, the radicalization of the Monroe Doctrine, and theorization of a pedagogical big stick for the recalcitrant peoples of Latin America, the annexation of the Philippines, and so forth. An analogous dialectic developed after the Bolshevik October. Issuing from a revolution that waved the banner of oppressed nations in Tsarist Russia, the colonies, and the world generally, the USSR in turn felt itself invested with a mission that pushed it to the point of theorizing a kind of Monroe Doctrine for the countries of Eastern Europe, to which it conceded only a limited sovereignty. Thus, while they significantly advanced emancipatory processes, the ideas that governed the abolitionist revolution in the first instance, and the Bolshevik revolution thereafter, functioned as an instrument for legitimizing imperial ambitions. Once again, then, the crucial question emerges in the case of both revolutions, were they worth it? But the question is ill-formulated. When Lincoln decided to respond to the challenge of the secessionist states, violence was already in train, and not only because the enslavement of a people is in itself, as Rousseau stressed, an act of war. The bloody assault by rebel troops on Fort Sumter had already occurred, and was itself preceded by attempts on the part of abolitionists in the North to introduce weapons into the South and appeals to the slaves to rebel. The war had been brewing for decades. This consideration applies a fortiori to the October Revolution, which erupted when the genocide it wanted to prevent had been raging for years. In the view of youth who adhered to communism, it was the war that seemed like a gigantic, inhuman experiment in social engineering. This furnace, smelting furnace, an instrument of regeneration of present social existence was celebrated by Gaetano Salvmini and Benedetto Croce.88 across the Atlantic, even after the signature of the armistice, Herbert Hoover credited the war with purifying men and thereby preparing a new golden age. His conclusion was a ringing one, we are proud to have taken part in this renaissance of humanity 89. On the other side, Graham sighs irony about the enormous human and social costs of five years of purification, regeneration, and martyrdom was scathing. Point 90 The fact that they had been imposed from above confirmed that the subaltern classes were mere human material, raw material for the history of the privileged classes. Point 91 In the young revolutionaries' view, there was a direct line leading from the liberal tradition to interventionism. Regarded for centuries as lacking in human dignity in the full sense, the semi-bestial multitude could be calmly sacrificed in a war whose stake was also, or primarily, a division of colonies, or dominion over populations even more manifestly reduced to work tools and things. Having arrived in power on the back of protests against this world, communism in turn involved the sacrifice of millions of human beings, who were reduced to raw material for building a new society. Rousseau's admonition not long before the outbreak of the revolution that he unquestionably helped induce comes to mind once again, the blood of one man is worth more than the freedom of the whole human race. Albeit utopian, it contains an essential lesson that might be reformulated in Kantian terms, as an autonomous moral subject, every human being is an end in him or herself and cannot be degraded into an instrument for the attainment of higher ends. The Constant Moral Dilemmas of Our Time this truth is often mobilized to liquidate the Jacobin Bolshevik tradition that is also at work behind it. We have seen distinguished liberal thinkers equate wage workers with horses or machines and work tools, thereby denying them the dignity of moral subjects as well as political subjects. Even more radically and persistently, such a denial has operated to the detriment of members of inferior races. The decisive blows dealt to this world are key moments in conferring on every human being, regardless of race, property, and sex, the dignity of a moral subject, of being an end in him or herself. Making a major contribution to the attainment of this result, paradoxically, 
the French Revolution and the October Revolution help develop the theoretical and moral tools that enable us to adopt an attitude of mature critical distance towards them, which has nothing to do with the commonplace demonization beloved of Talman's sophism. When, focusing on their blameless victims, the autonomous moral subjects objectively reduced to means in the course of the many revolutions that mark the birth of today's world, people query their legitimacy and expediency, they are unaware of the fact that such questioning was precisely made possible by those revolutions. On the other hand, it would be naive to think that with the new situation political and moral dilemmas have disappeared. Was it right to support the Gulf Wars, and was it right to support the prolonged embargo imposed on Iraq? The consequences of the latter were described thus in an article in the Washington Post signed by the director of the Center for Economic and Social Rights, According to estimates by UN agencies, more than 500,000 Iraqi children have died from hunger and disease, roughly the combined toll of two atomic bombs on Japan and the recent scourge of ethnic cleansing 92 that calculation dates from 1996, thereafter the toll increased considerably. We are dealing with a kind of postmodern version of the concentration camp. In the age of globalization, there is no need to deport a people, it is enough to block the flow of food and medicines, especially if one succeeds in destroying aqueducts, drainage systems and health infrastructure with intelligent bombing, as happened in Iraq. What will future historians say about this man-made famine, this collective death sentence, pronounced not in the course of a ruthless civil war or a dramatic life and death struggle between great powers, but in peacetime, without even the justification of the Cold War? Such criticisms are generally answered by pointing to the need to pursue the struggle against a dictatorial, criminal regime. But here is the reply of the article cited above, however grave the list of charges against Iraq's leaders, it cannot justify resort to a terrible collective punishment, a practice typical of totalitarianism. If the collective punishment inflicted on an already exhausted people had really aimed to defend the cause of democracy and peace, and it is possible to entertain the strongest doubts, a bitter conclusion would impose itself. We might formulate it by referring to a text by Marx that we have already cited. It invokes a great social revolution bringing about a situation where human progress ceases to resemble that hideous pagan idol, who would not drink the nectar but from the skulls of the slain. Point 93 While faith in a great social revolution, definitively resolving things, has vanished the tragedies to which it sought to put an end are still the order of the day.